It gives me uh, immense pleasure uh, to welcome all our uh, esteemed uh, speakers uh, for today's webinar and our participants uh, uh, for the webinar today hosted by RTI and ISGF on electricity distribution, creating the change. The grid in the next decade will be very different than the present day's grids in most parts of the world. Clean energy from solar, wind, will, which could be stored cheaply and transported as well, will very much be a possibility. And a strong driving force for the change is the shift in the attitudes and the behavior among the consumers. Our consumers are becoming very demanding. And on the other hand, the consumers are becoming producers of energy as solar panels become less expensive and we see increased electrification in our society, such as the uptake of uh, electric cars, electric vehicles, also getting uh, on the roads and getting injected uh, in the, uh, to the grid in future. Increasingly, more of our consumption will require reliable electricity supply. Electricity use in India is projected to triple by 2040, driven by the economic growth, higher average income, and better income distribution. The rapidly increasing use of electric applications, including EVs, as I mentioned, population growth, and urbanization. Therefore, the, to become future ready, and uh, yet remain within the sustainable envelope of network net zero uh, carbon emissions targeted at the national level by 2050. Distribution utilities will need to control losses, enhance investments in smart metering, digitalization, and uh, becoming more efficient and uh, having a skilled set of employees to be able to adopt and take uh, <coughs> Uh, digitalization journey of the utilities forward. With that background, uh, we, with this webinar, we wish to uh, address some of the key issues by uh, with uh, the expert uh, discussion with our uh, expert panelists here today. I am Reena Suri, Executive Director, India Smart Grid Forum. I am the host for uh, today's uh, webinar. I'll take just a few minutes to quickly introduce our moderators and panelists for today. And before that, a quick glance at uh, today's agenda. We will have uh, Mr. Sanjeev uh, Ahluwalia uh, uh, addressing uh, or making the opening remarks and setting the agenda. Dr. Gaurav Bhatiani will uh, provide the structure and key issues that we'll be taking forward. And as well as uh, moderating, uh, uh, Mr. Sanjeev and Gaurav, uh, Dr. Bhatiani will be moderating today's panel discussion with our esteemed panelists, uh, Mr. S. Padmanabhan, Dr. Rajiv Mishra, Mr. Rajiv uh, Reji Kumar, Mr. Uh, Prabhi Niyogi, Ms. Anjali Garg, Ms. Shala, Mr. Uh, Shalap uh, Shivasal, followed by some question answers uh, by the moderators to the panelists. And we'll also be taking up some questions from the audiences. So you're most welcome to post your questions in the chat box uh, and uh, our moderators will scan through and take up some uh, key questions with our panelists. I'll quickly introduce our. Uh, there is some people complaining. Right now, there is some people posted on the chat box that there is no audio. Please check, uh, Nidhi. Please check. Thank you. I, uh, you can hear me. Yes, we can. We'll check. We'll okay. Definitely. We can hear you clearly. Oh, excellent. Okay, so uh, quickly introduce our moderators and panelists. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Sanjeev Aluwalia. He's the advisor with Observer Research Foundation. Um, uh, Mr. Aluwalia remains affiliated with uh, the Energy Research uh, Institute where he worked for three years and uh, Cut Center for Infrastructure Regulation and Competition in an honorary capacity. Warm welcome to you, Mr. Aluwalia. We have uh, Dr. Bhatiani from uh, is the Director Energy with RTI India. Uh, Dr. Bhatiani will be moderating uh, this, will be co-moderator today uh, with Mr. Aluwalia. He's uh, the Senior Energy and Infrastructure Expert uh, with 
24 years of experience in leadership, management, technical, and advisory positions across South Asia. Welcome, Dr. Bhatiani. We have uh, Mr. Prabir Niyogi as our first panelist. Uh, I'm introducing, he's the Chief Advisor, uh, Corporate Affairs with CSE Kolkata, and currently uh, advising uh, RP Goenka Group, uh, RP Sanjeev Goenka Group in matters related to corporate affairs and assisting group companies in policy and regulatory matters impacting individual businesses. And he brings over 40 years of uh, experience with ut in utility industry and uh, uh, holds uh, leadership positions involving business transformations in uh, power and coal sector. Warm welcome to you, Mr. Neogi. Mr. S. Padmanabhan, uh, he's, uh, uh, he's retired from senior, as a senior energy advisor from USAID India. Mr. Padmanabhan has 35 years of experience and has worked as senior energy advisor with World Bank, USAID, and several agencies of Government of India. He's an enthusiast, advocate, writer, designer, planner, devoted to sustainable development and energy conservation. Warm welcome, uh, Mr. Padmanabhan. We have uh, next panelist, uh, Mr. Rajiv uh, K. Mishra. He's the director uh, from uh, uh, PTC. Mr. Uh, Mishra, he heads the uh, business development marketing uh, department of PTC India Limited. He's the key person personnel for business development activities related to power purchase and sale under open access. And he's also responsible for cross-border trade uh, power trading for Bhutan, Nepal, and Bangladesh. A warm welcome, Mr. Mishra. We have uh, Mr. Shalab Srivastav. He's the country uh, director, uh, RTI International India. Mr. Srivastav brings two decades of management uh, consulting experience uh, to his current role. Uh, he focuses on uh, penetrating new markets in the Indian uh, subcontinent in the sectors of uh, power, renewables, clean uh, hydrocarbon fuels, air quality, and uh, smart cities. And I would like to also mention that uh, he has been a co-author of uh, 2016 update to Smart Grid uh, Roadmap for India, which was published by India Smart Grid Forum. And he's also a board member of uh, India Smart Grid Forum. Warm welcome to you, uh, Mr. Shalab. And uh, next we have uh, Mr. Rajikumar Pillai. He's the president of uh, India Smart Grid Forum. Uh, uh, since the inception of the forum in 2011 and is also the chair of uh, Global Smart Grid Federation, which is an umbrella uh, body of, of uh, similar organizations uh, like ISGF in different countries since November 2016. He's an internationally renowned expert uh, with over three decades of experience in the electricity sector in diverse functions covering the entire value chain and across, uh, across continents. Warm welcome, Mr. Pillai, to the webinar. And uh, we're glad to have uh, uh, female uh, uh, panelists with us, uh, Ms. Anjali Garg, energy specialist from IFC. Uh, she has, uh, uh, she's bringing 19 years of experience across uh, public and private sector. Her expertise lies in renewable energy, energy access, and regulatory policy issues in the energy sector and climate finance. A warm welcome, Ms. Gerg. With that, I uh, uh, invite uh, Mr. S, uh, Mr. Sanjeev S. Aluwalia to present the opening remarks and uh, for setting the agenda for today's webinar. Over to you, Mr. Aluwalia. Thank you, uh, Reena. I hope I'm audible. Try to unmute myself. Is it okay? Yes, you're audible. Yes, we can hear right. you. <clears throat> Great. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And a special thanks to uh, RTI and to the Indian Smart Grid Forum for inviting me to moderate uh, the session along with Dr. Gaurav Bhattiani. And a warm welcome also to all the participants. I mean, uh, Reggie and Reena were telling me that there's something like 1,500 people who signed up for this program. So I hope that, uh, you know, at least one half of them have actually bothered to clock in. And, and listen to this wonderful panel that uh, the two organizations have put together for you. Uh, it's a panel which actually demonstrates different skill sets and different experiences. But what is common is their 
a commitment to excellence, their deep commitment to working in the energy sector and to solving real problems on the ground. Uh, my job here is actually just to um, kind of like a filler between you and the panelists, so I will not take long at all. And my job really is to, uh, you know, give a little bit of uh, uh, perspective uh, within which you should think of uh, the power sector during this webinar. You know, you know, if you if you if you are reading about the power sector, I'm sure that many specialists and uh, you know engineers and economists and others who are in the participants. So uh, this is known to them, but possibly there are others who are not that familiar but would like to learn. And so what I'm going to say is really for them, for the learners, not for the gurus who are sitting in the audience. Um, mind, I might remind you that you are not going to be sitting there only. You're also going to be participating in a short while because the way uh, uh, India Smart Grid Forum organizes these things is very interactive and very participative. So, um, you know, if you think, uh, let's adopt a balance sheet approach to looking at the power sector in India today. And by that, I mean looking essentially, starting by looking at, you know, the assets and the liabilities. Now on the asset side, uh, let's first start with generation. Now generation, you know, is a, a unqualifiedly a great story. Uh, generation capacity over the last 26 years, 26 odd years, um, has grown by something like 5.5 uh, uh, times. And um, if that doesn't impress you, then, uh, you know, uh, the fact that we are or have been surplus in power uh, for the last two years or so uh, should speak uh, to the fact that India has overcome the traditional problem that was that, you know, a supply never could meet demand. Well, today, uh, supply can meet demand, even though demand may be muted for various reasons, but there is enough supply today to meet demand. And that's an important uh, thing to happen because it's only when you have sufficient supply that you can go towards the objective that the 1991 reforms uh, looked at, which is market orientation. You know, you can't have a market orientation when you have huge uh, demand shortages. The first prerequisite of a market is to have a surplus so that people can sell it, sellers can compete to sell what they have and buyers can compete to buy what sellers have. That has actually happened in generation. The second important, uh, I think, uh, development in generation is that, you know, there's a spatial shift in generation assets. When we started way back 30 years ago or even earlier, most of the generation used to happen in the east, uh, some in sort of east central part and then in the south. But since then, and with the gas and renewable energy becoming respectively 10 and 22 percent of our power capacity um, portfolio, uh, the spatial distribution of generation assets has shifted in favor of the West, uh, where a lot of the gas is imported, and the South, where because the economy has grown very fast, uh, the need for power has grown very fast, and therefore there has been an incentive, you know, to set up uh, imported coal plants, gas plants, and, uh, and also put up plants which are still importing coal from from Eastern and Central India. Um, ownership has also undergone an enormous change. When we started 1991, most of the assets were publicly owned. There was very uh, minuscule private ownership of power. And Mr. Neogi is one of the exemplary examples, you know, of a company that was privately owned and was working well along with Tata Power uh, at that time and BSES, of course, uh, but very, min very minuscule. Today, uh, you know, uh, 44, 44 or 45% of generation assets are held by the private sector. And the incremental addition of uh, generation has been more in the private sector over the last seven years than in the public sector. So that's an enormous change from the time, uh, you know, in the late 90s when Enron became the the kind of standard bearer of private participation in generation. And there was so much fuss being made about, you know, a single plant coming up. Uh, today, you know, we have 150 gigawatts of private power, something like that. 
and it's taken for granted. And that's good because that means that India has grown. Now, the other great change that has happened is in the structure. In the structure of these generators, they aren't departments of government anymore as they used to be. They are not just publicly owned corporations as they used to be. Today, many of these generators, actually I would say most of them, are uh, definitely public limited corporations and many of them are also listed on the stock exchange. So you have a daily, uh, daily barometer you know, of their success or their failures in the market value of their stock, which is an enormous change from what was there earlier. And all this therefore is a sign of the maturity of the generation sector. Now the sad part is, and this is where the liabilities part of the balance sheet kicks in, that you know, while all the attention was being focused on generation over all those many years, um, the, the other part of the electric power sector, which is the distribution sector, was in a way I would say neglected or not given as much importance because we were, you know, we were unpeeling the onion layer by layer. And the first layer was to become surplus in generation. The next layer was to have strong, robust transmission. And uh, that happened. Uh, towards the late, uh, you know, after around 2010 to 2013, because transmission capacity over, uh, has grown seven times over 12 years, right? And in that, uh, I don't know, so practitioners would remember that there used to be a choke point where power could not be sent from the west or the east to the south. because demand was huge in the south, but plants were all outside the south and you couldn't, you know, transmit power into the south. There was a choke point over there. And that choke point got opened up uh, by a three times growth in the capacity to transfer power from the east and the west uh, over a period of seven years, last seven years, uh, into the south. So there was a strategic investment in the transmission sector, which also made Indian transmission um, of near international quality. Now, we, you know that we had a big uh, blowout, a blackout about when was it, about three or four years ago. These things do happen. But on a daily basis, if you look at the way the frequency is, the grid frequency, it's pretty good. And uh, I, I can, I, I mean, I, I take pride in saying that because, you know, I was in the CERC when the first availability based tariff, the first little baby step was taken to ensure that there were market incentives for getting the grid frequency right. And today, there are so many complex arrangements which ensure that the grid frequency remains stable so you don't have blackouts and brownouts. So transmission has also matured. Going on to um, is, uh, distribution, on the asset side, it's a good story. You know, If you look at the agricultural pumps that uh, they energize, there has been, uh, they've grown by twice as much as they were in 2010. So in the last nine years, you've added on double the number of uh, pumps. In terms of households, it is today, you know, a household fact, the Prime Minister's program has brought, uh, has energized about 26 million uh, households, which did not have electricity earlier over the last three to four years. And it's kind of a huge achievement internationally. And today, not only in the old days, we used to talk about villages, that scenario got over by about 2016-17. All the villages were electrified. Now all the households are electrified. So that part of access is assured to distribution. The sad part is that the distribution business is not in good health. And um, it makes losses which average anything around 30 to 70,000 crores a year, which is massive amount, which pulls down the strength and the capacity of distribution entities to invest in their systems and give better services to their customers. Um, so uh, that is the biggest liability that we have on the, on the balance sheet. But uh, if you look at the uh, CEA's report 2018, in fact, even I was surprised to see this, that, you know, there are eight states where, which supply 24-7 power, including Gujarat, uh, to their customers. There are another six states that supply between 23 to 24 hours of power a day. To their customers and another another three that supply 20 to 23 hours and there are just 10 states and oddly enough this includes 
Haryana and Karnataka. Uh, Mr. Padmanabha will be interested to see whether this statistic is right or not. Your state, sir, just gives power for uh, you know less than 20 hours a day. Now, I don't know, less than is a strange number because it could also be two hours a day and three hours a day. So there's a big range. But you know, I mean, imagine the, uh, my generation grew up you know, with Lalten and candles and things like that. Today you have 18 out of 28 states where you get more than 23 hours of supply a day. That's a massive change. That's a huge change in the quality of, of, uh, of uh, supply. So, you know, um, so, so what is wrong with distribution? Now, one is clearly this tariff is wrong. See, the, 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 the idea of the 1991-92 reforms was to, to de-license, to take away administrative, administrative controls so that markets could operate and you know that goods could be supplied and, and, and distributed cheaply. Uh, we have an administered tariff today. And as a result of that, it's distorted. And because of that, I think, uh, you know, you're, you don't get the kind of revenues that you could if tariff was, was allowed to be freer than it is today. Now, there is a case there for lifeline supply, particularly in electricity as in water. But the financial burden of that should very clearly come from the state governments, not from the distribution utilities. I think this statement will resonate, will resonate with Mr. Nyogi, who was an old distribution hand. But it's, there's a lot of truth in it. You know, if your distribution sector is not strong, your power sector is weak. It is weak. It will not grow. It will not sustain itself. It will not supply quality uh, power. Um, there are other, some good things. Uh, do I have time? Another one minute? I haven't spoken too much. So I'll just make one, two short points now. There are other good things that are happening, which we're going to be discussing during the, uh, during the, the, when we talk to the panelists also. And one is, you know, that finally, you know, there is a market operating in India. 9% of power is traded outside the long-term PPAs. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Mishra is, the, is going to be the founder of one of the latest new exchanges that PTC will set up in competition to the existing uh, exchange and both of these will be private sector. I don't know if you call this PTC private sector, but I mean from the books it looks like a private sector. So you know both of these will be more or less private sector exchanges, and that's a very 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 big change uh, for India. Um, so lastly, on uh, regulation, you know uh, I was a staff member of the CERC. So obviously I'm a fan of the CRC, you know, so I'm a bit biased. I have to admit that. But I think they've done a great job. Uh, more recently, you know, they had this very far reaching uh, 2018 um, uh, uh, regulation that they issued, uh, which was to allow the transmission of power through India uh, to third countries, which actually feeds directly into building a regional power market. And that is where we should be hitting Mr. Padmanabhan who's you know, a veteran of USA, they've been trying to build a regional power market since the 2000s. And we've moved very, very slowly. But hopefully with this regulation being in place, you know, I think that, that, dream, that dream will now um, become a reality. There are other good things they've done that they've tried to introduce a mechanism for enforcing contracts because you know, contract, contract enforcement has also led to some financial difficulties for uh, suppliers, basically on the provider side. And the uh, best thing that they are doing is to emphasize that, and the government is emphasizing now, that sub subsidy has to be borne by the state governments, not by the utilities. And uh, that state regulators are now probably may be appointed if the amendment goes through, uh, through, a, through a committee which includes people from the central government so that there is more similarity in views and in the in, in you know in the way regulators are recruited and uh, allowed to run these regulatory commissions in the in the state governments. Um, so, bottom line, I feel Indian Indian power market is matured, and the only thing is to realize the full potential of this market. We need four things. We need to further enhance markets. Dr. Mishra is doing exactly that. We need to make governments accountable for subsidy. 
the not only the central government, but even the regulators are trying to do that. We need to incentivize energy efficiency. Please remember that, you know, while the while generation capacity grew by 5.5 times only, the economy has grown by nine times in that same period, those same 26 years. So we, India has decoupled itself from additional energy uh, capacity and additional ge energy ge generation and therefore use, which is a very big step towards the climate, meeting the climate change objectives to which we're committed by 2035. Uh, one thing that we must do, however, is not to have a one size fits all type of approach, cookie cutter approach. It's a big country, there are 30 states. They should, each state should be allowed to develop its own model, you know, its own structure of uh, the power sector, which fits their own requirements. And it should fit into a national framework which has minimum standards embedded in it. That's all I wanted to say. Um, uh, I will now pass it over to Dr. Batiani with a word of apology, I think, for having taken longer than I thought I would. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I extend a very warm welcome to all our panelists and our participants. We appreciate uh, your taking time to be with us this afternoon and share your perspective and knowledge. Uh, thanks to Mr. Alwalia for opening remarks, brilliantly setting the agenda in a, in a succinct manner. You know, thank you. Uh, to begin with, you know, I want to quickly quote uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who once said, power always brings with it responsibility. So while he was talking about the political power, I think that applies equally to the electricity. Uh, that is, it needs to be generated uh, transmitted, distributed, and used, uh, you know, in a responsible manner. And uh, as uh, we have seen dramatic transformation, you know, in the generation uh, transmission regulation, uh, uh, there is, you know, uh, things a lot better, uh, but it can be uh, reasonably argued that, you know, on the distribution and use uh, of electricity, uh, that has perhaps not been the case. And therefore, uh, we are today here to discuss what are the options uh, for creating this change. And equally important, I think, how do we create a demand uh, for this change? Uh, this is so because you know, we have known for a while that a change is required, uh, but nevertheless, progress has been limited. Uh, therefore, creating a demand for change, I think, is an equally important goal in itself because, you know, in democratic societies and, as Sanjeev said, you know, market-based economies, uh, citizens and we as consumers need to play an important role. Uh, that is, you know, how are we responsible for, uh, you know, creating this demand for change. We have a very eminent panel and, uh, you know, what I'm going to do is quickly list seven areas and a few questions around those. And you know, then uh, I will invite uh, our panelists to start with their opening remarks for about five minutes each. So let me begin by saying, yes, number one area, which Mr. Aluwali also mentioned about is financing and tariffs. Uh, we have seen some progress in reducing the losses. There have been several schemes, you know, going back to APDRP, Uday, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the financial losses of the distribution companies have continued to increase. Uh, therefore, it's a legitimate question to ask, you know, uh, if, the, if the technical and commercial losses are reduced, uh, where are the gaps? And to what extent those gaps are due to tariffs, uh, uh, subsidies, and so on. So I think that's one area which we would like our you know, panel to touch upon. Uh, another related aspect uh, is at this juncture, uh, what is the ability of distribution companies to pay their immediate liabilities, particularly you know, with demand significantly coming down? And yesterday we had a discussion, a uh, decision at the, at the CCEA uh, to enhance the liquidity package, which I think is a positive step. Uh, but we also need to think about more you know, medium term strategy because this issue uh, is not going to solve itself, you know, with 370 gigawatts of capacity in the system and only around 185 or 190 gigawatts of demand. 
the second uh, question therefore then you know area is the planning and strategy what is the medium term strategy to resolve this issue where uh, you know utilities have too many ppas it seems you know and while a market has been created the volume still are about 10% 90% of the volumes continue to be in the in the long term ppa related aspect uh, you know is how and what are the areas for investment which distribution companies should prioritize given that they have only very limited capital allocate to invest in technologies operations etc so what should be those areas which should be prioritized should technology be one of them because you know often it has been touted as a panacea uh, but can technology deliver on its own you know without corresponding policy regulatory and institutional changes uh, is an area to think about while we you know uh, always talk about investments uh, often the operations and maintenance in distribution business uh, gets neglected and that's where you know the front line is or that's where the 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 rubber meets the road so operation and maintenance so that the existing assets are maintained and are we are able to take juice out of them deliver high quality service and lastly you know uh, is the area of ownership uh, and restructuring uh, there has been talk about privatizing uh, union territories the central government uh, has a plan at least to start with union territories i think that can create a positive momentum it can create best practices and uh, good examples which states can look at but is distribution privatization the end or is it a means to an end so i will at this point you know uh, stop here and you know invite our panelists to make opening remarks they can pick up one two three multiple areas i will request each of them to limit it to 7 minutes uh and uh, at the beginning i will invite mr padmanabhan sir the floor is yours um thank you gaurav um good afternoon to all of you um special thanks to reena suri and sanjeev aluwalia and gaurav batiani for the kind words and uh, your initiatives uh, specifically rtis and isgfs to organizing this important webinar on lcd distribution uh, creating the change uh, three broad steps that can create this change uh, one is mandating integrated resource planning the second is institutionalizing load research and the third is considering energy productivity as a performance indicator in the farm sector um, i'll uh, spend the next 5 uh, to 7 minutes uh, in Uh, talking a little bit about these three broad steps uh, much water has flowed uh, under the bridge since uh, power sector reforms took place in the early 90 in the early to mid 90s and uh, dr sanjeev alwali had described these rather well uh, there has been significant changes taken place in distribution and generation and so on but yet what are the unresolved all issues of the indian power sector reforms is distribution reforms uh, as i said several measures have been taken they have been more tactical than strategic and the results have been rather uneven notwithstanding the point that dr alwalia rightly mentioned about power supply to villages having improved many more pump sets having been brought online uh, many more households have received receiving power and so on and so forth but one more to look at the progress on digital fixes instead of a comprehensive overhaul i think we need to move from tactical responses to strategic planning and strategic planning in a requires a symmetrical approach to power planning rather than a sequential incremental approach so what this really means very simply said is that we need to evaluate the cost benefit of each of the segments of the power system uh, generation transmission distribution and end use and introduce the 
IRP methodology or the integrated resource planning methodology. We need to mandate IRP through regulations so that when a utility proposes, for instance, a power plant, we begin to compare the marginal cost of generation with the marginal cost of transmission and distribution and compare these with the cost of safe capacity and the cost of safe energy at the end use point and then decide as to where we would put in our resources. So the first point I would like without belaboring this any further is that we need to in, in, enshrine IRP in LCD Act as a principle and a covenant. The next point is that there have been several studies which uh, some of us were involved in both in India as well as in other parts of the world which basically show that it is cheaper almost to the extent of one-fifth to one-tenth to save a unit of energy than to generate an equivalent amount. And this can be accomplished through integrated demand side management, which is a combination of end use efficiency and demand response. But demand side management is all about data collection, analysis and execution. And this is where I think uh, we need to do a lot better. The load research function in most of our discoms have been neglected, which is a real pity because we do collect a lot of information compared to what it was, for instance, in the, in the 90s. I recall when I began some of my DSM work, very little information, if at all, was available. But today with metering and so on at all parts of the network, there's a whole lot of information available, and yet the load research function has been neglected. The quantum and patterns of uh, induced loads can be tracked and, and profiled in a load research program. And a lot of questions which need to be answered can be addressed, like how much of peak load demand uh, reduction is possible, how much of load shifting is possible, how deep can we go in terms of load management and so on. And how does the proposed DSM program compare with alternate uh, supply side generation, the point that I had made earlier? So I would suggest that we should make it mandatory through regulations with discounts to establish road research cells. And there are several other advantages of road research, uh, tariff setting, uh, network planning, network engineering, and so on. The flow of end use data must be turned inward to inform ways to manage loads through TOD tariffs design and application of efficient technologies. And discoms can be a game changer as far as DSM is concerned. And I'm responding to the point that uh, Sanjeev made about the need for energy efficiency. And discoms can be a game changer in addressing and advancing energy efficiency. It can be the largest procurer and aggregator of efficient technologies and systems in partnership with vendors and ESCOs. A beginning has been made by the Bureau of Energy Efficiency in authorizing discounts as designated consumers. The question to ask is whether within the ambit of their responsibilities as designated consumers, can discounts assume the role of megawatt generators, which implies the reverse of generating megawatts through integrated DSM programs. Now with this key question, let me come to my third point and I'll be brief and then maybe get a chance to expand upon it at the next round of questions. And this point is possibly the most important and this was something that uh, Gaurav, you highlighted as one of the points you would like us to touch upon and that is power supply to agriculture, the issue of subsidized pricing. I think we need to view the power sec supply to the farm sector a lot differently. We need to use agricultural energy productivity as the performance indicator for benchmarking and setting tariffs. What this means is that we need to implement schemes that promote increase in revenues from farm produce to enable farmers pay cost of supply to the discount and not subsidize tariffs. In short, we need to think of ways for farmers to increase their revenue 
per unit of energy consumed fundamentally it means we need to ask the question what is the energy used for by the farmers and can it be used to generate greater value addition and hence greater profits to the farmers for instance is the kusum pro program uh, or scheme of solarization of agricultural farm sets and setting up of decentralized solar power as an example there could be several other examples aimed at improving energy productivity through diversification and modernization of agricultural practices and not simply just energy efficiency to enable farmers earn more and farmers once they improve productivity of energy use in other words increase the value addition through diversification then they would be in a position to pay for the power and they don't need to get subsidized power anymore i shall be happy to elaborate further on this because i think this is a very very important point and i have not heard this in many discussions on power sector reforms where we could move away from a traditional approach of providing subsidy because that has not uh, addressed the issue the quality reliability of power to farms may have improved but the financial position of discoms to deliver the power has definitely not improved the 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 cost of supply is has been several magnitudes greater than the revenue that they get from the farm sector the way to deal with it is not to continue with the subsidy program not to continue the cross subsidization which takes place but to look at a very different way of approaching this entire issue of power supply tariffs and i would rest my case here and I'd like to elaborate on this at the next round thank you uh, thank you thank you mr padmanabhan that was very uh, uh, very well thought out structured kind of a, a look into the need for irp and efficiency enhancement uh, you know i think uh, gaurav batiani is a very wily man he set up this meeting in a very wily way because we are moving from a participant who advocates bringing back planning very micro level planning into the electricity act to a advocate of the private sector who wants all regulations except the least you know the most minimum regulations to be abolished that's dr rajiv mishra so dr mishra your comments uh thank you sir uh, it is really a pleasure uh, addressing to a gathering where we we have seen people from all corners right from regulators from usa uh, all the uh, mr reji from uh, smart grid uh, salab from the consulting side uh, so very interesting kind of a panel and you have set a tone where we need to understand the entire gamut of the sector but to more specific the today's agenda that is uh, the distribution although i represent market but i would limit today uh, the pain points of uh, the distribution as such and then the related areas in the market for that i have made a very small uh, presentation i would like to uh, get that uh, maybe it will not take more than 5 to 6 minutes and then i'll explain what i have in my mind when i'm trying to present this case uh, full screen please uh, next slide next slide please yeah uh, uh sanjeev you have very rightly said that india is made up of 30 states more than 80 distribution companies and whenever we are discussing we discuss about the issues of discoms so if we are discussing issues of the discoms either they need to be one and the same and one solution for all the discoms you rightly said ca has presented a case where more than 15 states are doing wonders there are 10 states who which are contributing 80% of the losses whatever is receivable in the ministry of power portal you will find only five states are contributing 80% of the receivables adnc losses for some states are at the range of around 40% some of the states it is 8 to 9% so that means we we can't discuss all the states or the discoms uh in one way and that's the what i am trying to see 
uh, from this small analysis which I have made, where it was before Uday, what happened after Uday, and there are a lot of new initiatives which government of India is now taking to uh, make this sector viable. So something very really interesting which has come out is the accumulated loss has grew by 90 percent since 1890. Five states are contributing almost 80 percent of the receivables and we have done analysis of the top 10 states which is contributing the biggest losses uh, for which we are saying the weakest link in the energy value chain is the distribution side. Next slide please. If I see the performance after Uday, it's very interesting, uh, which we can see. ADNC losses have come down since 2016 to 2019. That's a very important thing which has happened. And it is hovering around 80, 19%. The ABPC, that is average power procurement cost, has come down. Two contributions. One is we, as Sanjeev has mentioned, uh, there, there was surplus power. And the second is the renewable has come into four in recent times. So the average power procurement cost has gone down. The billing efficiency have gone up. Uh, it has reached to a level of 84%. ACS AARR gap, which came down till 2018, has again taken up. That means the gap between the average cost of supply and average cost of recovery is going up. That means there is a gap which needs to be filled. And the APPC per kilowatt hour is more or less flat. Next slide. Now, I, I mentioned that there are five or six states which are contributing the most and 19 states in the country are having eight ATNC losses, more than 15%. 26 states are having positive ACS ARR gap, which was targeted to bring down to zero. 18 states are contributing uh, having more than 100 crores outstanding uh, with Rajasthan individually contributing around, which is the highest, 22,000 crores of outstanding. Uh, so that means uh, the financial health of these states, if we just see the numbers, uh, JNK is contributing the highest ATNC losses. Similarly, Rajasthan is contributing uh, the highest uh, gap, that is ACS ASR gap. Uh, similarly, uh, the other parameters also are very reflective. But if I, I see from these numbers, we can say that five or six states are some, those states which we need to address very differently. I'll give you the some glimpse of each state, how they are performing. Next slide, please. Uh, so we have uh, analyzed different state uh, reports, including PFC uh, reports and the other UDA scheme uh, reports from different corners. Five states which are worth mentioning is Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, Jharkhand, Karnataka, Telangana, and Bihar. They contribute significantly, and some of the states are doing better uh, than those states. Uh, so, if the problem is in those states, what are the solutions uh, we, we, which we think we, we can address to? Next slide, please. Uh, we have taken the first case of Uttar Pradesh, where the Outstanding is more than 13,000 uh, crores. ADNC losses is very high. Uh, in some of the distribution uh, areas, it is less. But in eastern part of the uh, AD uh, discoms, it is much higher. The average power procurement cost for different states are very different. Uh, in uh, Uttar Pradesh, it is 3.73. Uh, then we can say that the way they are procuring power from the market, uh, uh, at the first instance, if I see the merit order and other ways, uh, it, it, it is not so efficient on the uh, face of it. If I just try to analyze uh, it in terms of parameters, target achievement after Uday, feeder metering and feeder metering was in rural and urban was done fine. Feeder segregation and smart metering was not done up to mark. DT metering urban was up to mark. Uh, DT metering retail was rural was not then. ATNC losses, which is the most important thing in Uttar Pradesh, is something which is worrisome for them. ACS, that is cost of supply and uh, revenue realization gap, is highest in Uttar Pradesh. So these out of uh, the uh, eight parameters, 
uh, in that five parameters they have not done up to mark and those are the concern area for uttar pradesh but let me tell you once again i am trying to repeat that if i go state by state the concern or the pain points are different for each state now uttar pradesh we know in atnc losses is a pain point whereas if i go to tamil nadu or telangana andhra pradesh the concern is totally different atnc losses in telangana andhra pradesh and tamil nadu may be very less within the limits things are different but uh, there the tariff rationalization is a problem they have not revised the tariff for last so many years the market or the renewable capacity what they have added in the last couple of years is is giving unbalanced kind of a portfolio for them to handle so if i go state by state i'll not go all the 10 states but i'm trying to give you a glimpse of the things how uh, the problem or the concern is different for each state if i go to the next slide please rajasthan i told out of the eight parameters only the feeder metering and uh, urban and rural they have done up to mark rest of all the parameters they need to uh, address those issues because the atnc losses is around 38% uh, no they have added 38% renewable in their capacity the outstanding payment is uh, 22000 plus high appc cost which is more than 4 rupees 70 paisa you will find some of the states procuring power at the rate of 2 rupees 80 paisa appc and uh, rajasthan i am not suggesting that uh, it is it is an immediate issue which they need to address but uh, to make a distribution company viable uh, you need to have all these parameters to be addressed uh, so that it, it should be made viable i'll skip all the other states uh, except for one of the southern states please go ahead next yeah andhra pradesh if i address I, if i try to see the appc rate seems to be on a higher side 3.87 acs arr cap is uh, around 75 paisa uh, so that is that means they need a tariff rationalization at this point of time and those are the concern areas which they need to address uh, rather than uh, if i compare it with the northern states the issues are different the atnc losses are very high uh, but here the tariff rationalization seems to be the main problem next please next 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 Bihar is a unique case again. Uh, the ATNC losses is a uh, 34.32 percent, and uh, the thermal power they are dependent up to extent of 92 percent. APPC rate seems to be much higher, 4 to 12 paisa. Receivable in those states are very high, 110 days. So the problem for Bihar may be very different from problem of Tamil Nadu, Telangana, and Andhra Pradesh. So we need to address those uh, problems in a state-specific way. Next, please. Jharkhand again, the similar kind of problem. Now, uh, in a very simple way, at this point of time, when I have a limited time, I would like to see it in four uh, very focused approach that if you need to make it the way we have done it in generation and transmission, uh, Sanjeev was very right in saying that the transmission is world class today in the country because we could address the issues which were there. Similarly, in generation, we could inject investment and we have larger participation of private so the first uh, pr proposition for distribution reforms can be carriage and content separation although it has not come in the electricity act amendment which is uh, e under consideration they have tried to bring some changes like sub licensee and distribution licenses but uh, in the way we all wanted from the industry that the carriage and content should be separated their wire business should be separate business and the supply electron business should be separate has not come Similarly, the tariff rationalization for some of these states, which has not gone for uh, their revision for the last so many years, need to be done uh, as early as possible. Uh, then franchising and distribution smart cities, like 100 cities have been identified as uh, smart cities. Why can't we have a distribution franchising for them or a sub licensee which can make them more efficient and a better way of handling things than what we are doing today? And of course, meter infrastructure and upgradation of course is high on the agenda for the government and for all the distribution companies. Next slide. Please. So uh, Act 2003 amendment uh, is trying to address some of the issues, but we still feel that the market need much more. 9% participation from the market, rest, rest all tied up on long-term PPA is not the solution. You need to give, enable the uh, distribution companies so that then they can procure best because 80% plus of their cost comes from 
depart procurement so the enabling them to buy it best from the market from the best source uh, will be one solution of course uh, the wire business can be upgraded only if it can be separated from distribution so if it's a loss making a uh, distribution company nobody is interested to uh, inject money in the wire business also so that's one area that need to be separated and uh, many other issues which we can address as and when it comes and gaurav will give me opportunity to ask specific questions on these issues which i can address but at this point of time i can say that one size fit for all is not the solution then then many more things uh, if you want the weakest link uh, to come back uh, to supplement the private generation and transmission and market uh, need to be done and uh, this is one area which needs attention of every policy maker and the regulator the highest and i understand they are giving uh, sufficient focus on this uh, with this i am trying to close thank you very much gaurav thank you sanjeev for giving me the opportunity thank you rajiv i think an excellent presentation uh, with lot of uh, detail a very interesting uh, and i don't know how correct this is but uh, a preliminary conclusion which uh, occurred to me as i was hearing you is there seems to be an inverse correlation in the sense that you know states which have managed to reduce losses seem to be lagging you know on tariff rationalization and the other way around so maybe you know in the next round uh, maybe a comment on that i would like to hear from you but next we have miss anjali gurg you know someone uh, who's looking at financing uh, both from equity and debt perspective and uh, you know it'll be very useful to hear anjali from you how uh, ifc for example is thinking you know about financing distribution uh, particularly as we move towards you know maybe more private sector participation because ifc uh, is you know looking to support private sector and uh, uh, what do you think also about you know uh, the the expansion of access which is a broader development agenda uh, for the world bank group anjali I got up. Can you hear me? Yes, Anjali, go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've been having some Wi-Fi issues. So I just wanted to check. Uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, inviting me. Big thanks to RTI and the India Smart Grid Forum, and special thanks to Reena for ensuring that everyone knows that there is a female on the panel, which could otherwise <laughs> would have been easily a uh, manual, as I call them. So thank you so much for <laughs> getting that gender balance, at least some gender balance. Uh, that's great so thanks a lot for that um so let me first begin by talking about a uh, little bit about ifc and what we have done globally because i assume a number of participants may actually not know why we are on this panel so the international finance corporation is a member of the world bank group and we are the largest development institution that works with the private sector and supporting the power sector among infrastructure is actually the heart of our strategy uh, for development globally we uh, work across uh, the power sector which is generation transmission and distribution uh, mostly in developing countries and our focus is uh, renewable energy uh, within that and uh, the objective is that we're trying to remove uh, barriers to private sector investment and which is why this whole conversation and all the issues that you're talking about become very important because ultimately from a private sector financing perspective all of these are critical so from the technology piece Uh, to the losses, uh, you know, to increasing access to innovation in business model, all of them come together for any distribution company to be able to attract private sector financing. So I think this whole conversation is very, very apt, very, very meaningful. Uh, from an IFC perspective, distribution is a very important area among uh, the whole power sector. Uh, globally, we have actually invested in more than thirty, uh, we more than thirty investments. in uh, in distribution and we've reached more than 100 million customers so that that's quite a number and we've worked uh, across many many countries including brazil turkey uh, there's uganda bolivia uh, russia and many others i just want to briefly talk about uh, you know how does ifc get involved in the whole sector and then come to india and the access uh, piece uh, and question got that you asked 
So just an example, uh, you know, how IFP along with the World Bank too uh, comes, comes and, you know, helps uh, the power sector, especially distribution, uh, get transformed and private sector financing to flow in. Anjali, it seems there is some challenge at your end. Maybe you can switch off the video and uh, uh, be on can the Can you hear me now, Karo? Yes, yes, please. Okay, Go I'll switch off the video. Sorry for this. I think the rain have been really hit the Wi Fi hard. Uh, so I was talking about what we have done in Uganda and how the entire World Bank group comes together to facilitate private sector financing and mobilize resources. Uh, not just in distribution, but overall, but I'll give you the example particularly for distribution. So uh, there is a distribution company in uh, Uganda where we actually started investing about a decade ago. And we have been a long-term investor uh, in that distribution company. We've really, uh, you know, worked with that distribution company on both the investment side as well as the advisory side. Because the whole objective is to, uh, you know, make them do, make them go through the process and get them to transform completely where they're able to connect more consumers, uh, they're improve, able to improve their efficiency, they're able to reduce losses. So we are a long-term partner in this. Uh, we are not somebody who just invests and uh, go out. We bring in a lot of other uh, expertise. And in this journey of 10 years, uh, Maven now has you know, a customer base of 1.3 million uh, customer, customers, which is huge for Uganda. And you know we brought together uh, multiple arms of the World Bank group to uh, make this happen. So this was just to tell you how you know we work uh, and what is our interest as a private sector invested in this uh, Now coming to India, uh, you know as all of you and Sanjeev also mentioned in his uh, remarks and other people also have been mentioning the enormous financial pressure that is there on our distribution companies and the significant operational and financial efficiency. I mean this is something which everybody uh, knows. And for any private sector financing to come in, it is very important for you know to, for, for them to have a line of sight on how this is all going to change. And uh, you know the recent uh, conversation that we are having on the franchises and the big licenses and the innovation in business model. I think all of this could be great to unlock private sector financing in India. And I see we are really interested and in looking at this sector uh, very very closely. Uh, but I think what is important is that. The distribution companies also need to uh, be more inward looking. They need to look at their business model. They need to really look at, uh, you know, their operations uh, can change and how multiple things come together, whether it is, you know, the franchises or whether it is rural energy provision, uh, or whether it is billing and collection changes, energy efficiency, all of that and the impact that it would have on their balance. Then only private sector financing uh, could come in when, you know, on that path of corporatization and privatization. So that's what I wanted to talk about, you know, from how, how does IFC look at this uh, sector and what will it need to happen in the sector and in distribution companies for a gap. Anjali, uh, are you finished? I got up. Can you hear me? Yes, we, we missed the last uh, few sentences. I I'm think. really sorry for this. Uh, so I just I just wanted to quickly talk about uh, you know the access piece uh, because Sanjeev spoke about it, Ms. Padmanabhan spoke about it, and you spoke about it, and I think all of this comes together. The hub scheme and the percent electrification. Uh, you know, the energy efficiency piece and discount losses. So I think it's important uh, for us to, if you put all of this together and Anjali, uh, we are missing you. So maybe, you know, uh, we take this point in the second round, uh, if that is okay. 
Chicago and I just want to be in the second round. I think let's move on to the next panelist and we'll take Anjali's point okay. in the second round, sir. All right. So, you know, uh, normally it is said that the electricity sector lags telecommunications, right? In terms of delivery, service delivery and efficiency of services. But I think what is happening today is a clear example that actually a time has come in India where the reverse is true, that there are electrical services, but telecom is breaking down. So uh, let us move on that note to a uh, doyan of the electricity sector, Mr. Prabir Miyogi, um, who has devoted his entire life to serving consumers, you know, in the way they should be consumed uh, and through a private sector company, one of the earliest private sector distribution companies. Sir, your views on what all these young people are all saying, does it make any sense from the perspective of a long time practitioner? And thank you, Sanjeev, uh, uh, for the introduction. Uh, it's a bit generous, no doubt. Uh, yes, there's a lot much to learn, uh, you know, uh, from we get to know nowadays uh, from the younger generation because uh, the platform is changing, technology is turning around. So the uh, any business, you know, what it used to be a couple of de decades back is, is entirely on a different footing. But firstly, let me also thank uh, ISGF and RTI, you know, for arranging the discussions and giving me the opportunity. And uh, between the moderators, Sanjeev and Gora, we have already laid out the turf. So let me let me try and, and, and uh, address uh, the, the issues which Gaurav has raised and also take on from where the, the earlier panelists had left. Firstly, in terms of distribution reforms, uh, let's try to understand that uh, it's a process and it's, it's also part of the decision making under a political economy. Having said that, uh, you would recall that almost all the states without exception uh, have not been in favor of the amendments proposed under the Electricity Act. And one of the issues they have raised is centralization of powers. So that becomes an issue. So unless and until we have legislative support for what we want to do, it's not going to happen. Because eventually, you know, when distribution is under state ownership, the execution on the ground becomes more of a principal agent relationship with very little accountability. Now, is that going to change under private ownership? Yes, provided there is competition. But I, I, I'll rest my argument there, but I, I'll rather move on to uh, changing the narrative a bit. First of all, what have we achieved? You know, Sanjeev, you rightly drew up the balance sheet and uh, Dr. Rajiv Mishra also uh, charted out, you know, the progress or the lack of progress we have been making in distribution sector and he has been able to you know, point the, the uh, anomalies uh, among the states, uh, some good, some bad. Uh, firstly, see what have we achieved? Uh, if you leave aside the, uh, the balance sheet issues, uh, our per capita consumption is one of the lowest. We are not meeting the SDG 7 goals. So eventually what purpose the industry is serving? We also have the paradox of uh, power surplus with unreliable power supply. We also have the paradox of high electricity prices hurting exports. So we are, which segment of the consumer are we really serving? Is it the industry? Is it the com is it commerce? Is it agriculture? But Mr. Padvanavan spoke about free electricity to uh, or subsidized electricity to uh, agriculture. But finally, which end are we serving? Again, I'll rest my argument there and I'll move on to what COVID-19 has really taught us. We have seen that our business model under distribution is extremely fragile. 
if not inflexible, because we are overly dependent on cross-safe subsidizing consumer supporting the bulk of the revenue. That's one. So is it, is it the right way we are taking up the cross-subsidy part? In my mind, it is not. I, and I'll come to that. Who is? It also shows our business model is not resilient to demand shocks. Okay, it's accentuated by COVID, but it's going to come. And if you don't see the writing on the wall, we are not going to survive under the existing distribution structure. Meaning thereby, and this issue has been touched upon already, that distribution companies sooner or later are going to declining load growth because of the onset of energy efficiency as a resource because of the increasing influence of demand side management and demand response systems, because of the increasing ingress of distributed energy resources, electric vehicles included. So that's the landscape. Now, is my business model sufficient and flexible enough to face the future shock? To my mind, no, and that is what COVID-19 has, COVID has laid bare. So it's a wake up call. Now, I'll change track a little bit and see where do distribution lies in the context of a economic reforms. Now, you, you rightly said, Pasanji, that you know, we have made so much of progress in generation tra transmission. But the bottom line is the industry as a whole is bleeding. Why it's bleeding? Because as of June, the discoms owe as much as 1.2 lakh crores to Jengos. So that's one part. So if electricity is to be taken as a conduit of lifestyle improvement and economic transformation, then A, it has to be costed. Costed properly, which means, you know, the tariff orders are to be timely, appropriate. B, user charges are to be paid. And here there's a huge trust deficit because as consumers, I feel I'm not getting the service. There is no value for money. I don't see any entrenched value in electricity, which is what you know we have not been able to carry through. See, as you rightly said, contracts have to be enforced, which means you know the adjudicate adjudication process under regulation has so far been found wanting, and hence you know there is an amendment proposed. Because the arbitration is also not not a not a so not 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 a means we have found to be very effective in the Indian context. And lastly, you know the projects have to be enabled, new projects because capacity expansion is necessary to keep pace with growth. Now, distribution reforms will have to serve this economic context of being able to finance the growth of the industry because in distribution is where the cash lies. That's one. So, you know, unless you, you, you are adept and inadequately collecting the cash against your sale of electricity, you are nowhere. So we come down to the basic process, business process of metering, billing, collection and loss control. So that's, that's all about distribution. There is another economic context which Dr. Mishra touched upon and it's very pertinent. We have to, and that's a market context. We have to understand that A, regulatory businesses with guaranteed returns will increasingly come under political headwinds. You, you just can't sit pretty tight, say, seeing that you know, I'm going to earn 15, 16% a week. So your cost of capital will be under stakeholder question all through. If that be so, you have to find a way to reduce the cost of your service. And the, and, and, and the point to start with is the cost of power. Because as for the PFC report, it is as much as 70% of your cost. So it is a market, it is a contestability, it is a market, it is a competition, which is going to reduce your cost of power. How? By deepening the short-term market by having a high-resolution short-term power. How to do it? 
we have to find a way of PPAs, existing PPAs, legacy PPAs, to be market compliant, to be compliant with wholesale market uh, operation. How do you do it? Yes, there is already a discussion paper. We can go into the details. Uh, the basic purpose is that there is also a proposal of recompensing the, the generators. So that, you know, having set up the cap capacity and entered into PPA, they are not left uh, in the large. So that, that, that's one. Two, what does it mean for TISCOM? And that is where, you know, reforms are contextual. It means that you can't just you know, rest on executing a long-term PPA based on some kind of forecasting which doesn't have a scientific basis. And end up paying your fixed charges by not scheduling power. So you have to have a have an optimum portfolio construct of power procurement based on meeting your base loads for which you will have term contracts, forward contracts. The market now allows you you know, term contract beyond 11 days. So it need not be always 25 years. It can be month ahead, season ahead. It can be a year ahead contract. That's all. You will also have to base quite substantially on market-based procurement, on day ahead and intraday basis. If necessary, you will have to do contingency planning. Why? Because there is more and more ingress of renewable energy more and more penetration of distributed energy resources. You have to accommodate that. You have to make a platform of integrating DR with your mainstream functions. That is how the model is going to change. That is where regulation has to come in more effectively. That is where you will have to provide incentives for investing in facilitation of DR platform. So it will be the, such investment should be taken as capital asset for rate based calculation, or you may have to build up a layer of incentives on existing cost of service regulations by benchmarking performance with improvement in system efficiencies, peak load reduction, as well as system load factor improvement. So these are the areas, you know, where distribution reforms have to now step in. So there is a market context. And if I may extend the uh, argument further, there is also a climate context of enabling more and more DA, DERs into the system, as I said, EV included. So eventually regulation also have to take a different course in terms of encouraging energy efficiency and demand side management by bringing in more, by bringing in effectively the time of day tariff, not the way it is today, but you have to bring in the concept of critical, critical peak, peak pricing, as well as time of use uh, uh, price, which, which, may, which will make a very clear distinction and generate price sensitive signals for consumers to move beyond voluntary load shifting to a regime of interruptible loads which can be pumped back into the system. So there is an economic context, as I said, there is a, there is a market context, there is a climate context, but last but not the least, and that is the missing piece, there is a customer context. See, if you look at UK, you know, the reforms were successful because they were repeatedly revisited in the context of whether customers were getting the benefit of price advantage or servicing. And that's how, you know, the RPI minus X came in. So there was a rebalancing. Rebalancing of costs set off by efficiency gains. One, and then they moved on to the RIIO concept, which is basically revenue being a function of investment, innovation, which is again linked with uh, climate change interventions and your outcome. So it all changed. They kept on changing because they found that there was some kind of market failure in addressing the consumer interests. And again, you know, I was reading the other day, it only came out a couple of days back, during the ongoing COVID in US, you know, the most trusted provider rated right by the, the business consumers, the industry, has been found to be the utility ahead of primary banks and vendors with whom they trade. That's because, you know, they were making the interventions of rate changes, which, which is allowable in their context, may not be in ours, 
but they were also giving them the different expenditure plan so it is it basically shows your alignment with customers which is what we don't do which, which narrative we don't have and as they very clearly say that reforms don't succeed in fact they fail if they are not understood believed and accepted by those whom they affect so this is the communication we are missing so in terms of uh, gaurav's question of uh, financing and tariff there are two suggestions you know i have in mind one is in the context of cross subsidy the way we deal with it is not right we can't wish away subsidy in an economy like ours where you know we where where energy security and access is low uh, give give me some time i'll just connect my battery okay just <laughs> Yeah, I'm so I'm, I'm sorry, sorry for the interruption. Yeah, uh, so essentially we are saying that in the context of consumers, you know, this is the trust deficit we have because you know the consumers would always feel that you know what I'm paying for is not there. Coming back to cross subsidy, see there are very there are alternative pathways. One is what the economic survey has suggested. as i said you know we can't do away dispense with subsidy altogether in an economy in in, in our context like ours uh, first and foremost is that one may consider intra category cross subsidization within the same consumer class and this is what has been tried in bangladesh in our neighboring countries bangladesh sri lanka as well as vietnam and they have shown a much higher progressivity of tariff within the same consumer category meaning thereby that those in the in the higher consumption bracket will be subsidizing those who belong to the low income groups and it's a ditto for industry commerce as well as residential consumers the second alternative is that we can always create an universal charge which 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 will be a uniform charge payable by every consumer depending on his consumption so it's it's a unitary charge except those who fall in lifeline and bpl categories so that is in terms of cross subsidy <laughs> yeah. yeah sanjeev you want to say something hello i know <laughs> i muted myself because my dog was barking not me no okay so i thought no you wanted to intervene i mean if i was overstepping my time i'll i'll quickly come to the point the other thing is the retail tariff construct you know it's a something where we have to be a little diligent about why i'll say is because see we are always in a regime of average cost of stuff. you know that doesn't work with consumers and that also does not give the regulator an overview of what cost is incurred in serving consumers the proposal we have and we have worked on this uh, with ministry of power is that we must have a system of cost functionalization which will be according to the costs incurred under generation transmission and distribution then cost classification so essentially you know it's basically identifying the fixed and variable costs and finally the cost allocation according to network and energy usage in each consumer category under the the appropriate voltages now once you do that and once you share it with customers and there is no harm in doing that because eventually when you file your tariff you know your your books are open for public scrutiny so once a consumer understand that this is a cost you know a cost to serve and we we also have seen that you know, if you do a pilot study identifying the cost of outage so once you correlate the cost of service vis-a-vis -vis the cost of outage 
you know, what happens is a consumer sees the intrinsic value of electricity and then, you know, he has the willingness to pay. And once he has a willingness to pay, and that answers Gaurav's question that how do we do a bit of tariff rationalization? And then the next measure, of course, for the DISCOM to, to, to make sure that he also has the ability to pay. So it's, it's basically doing a kind of tariff regime you know, where the consumer is also part of the operations, has an insight of the utility operations, and then, you know, he, he becomes your partner in progress. And uh, uh, Gaurav, should I stop here? Because I think, you know, I have been overstepping the time, but uh, there are a few other issues which I will like to address, uh, uh, basically on your idea of what strategy should be followed in terms of uh, PPA adequacy, what investments are to be done, and finally, how the ownership and management control uh, is to be addressed. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Niyogi. Yes, we will come back to you in the second round. Uh, we are somewhat behind the schedule and therefore I will request uh, now, you know, our next two speakers, uh, Veji and Chalab, to, you know, try to contain their remarks within five minutes. So, Veji, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Gaurav and Sanjay. And uh, thank uh, Shalab also for this great idea to have a webinar like that uh, during this uh, lockdown period or semi-lockdown period. ISGF ourselves have not been doing too many webinars uh, over this uh, couple of months. Uh, well, we talked about many bad things and good things and problems. So I'd like to start with some uh, good notes. So as Sanji has said that we have sold the uh, supply problem. So when I started my career in early 80s in uh, uh, the India installed capacity was somewhere around 35 36 but more than 300,000 megawatts less than 40 years it has gone to 10 times so that's a great stride which you have made looking at where we started in 47 we had only 1300 megawatts so the, and we have a compared to many other developed countries we have a transmission grid which is much more modern uh, smarter and the entire 3 million square kilometer of the, the subcontinent is on one grid and which, which is uh, fairly stable and we have all sophisticated control systems on that and 690,000 villages we have electrified that too the second time in 2005-2006 we reclassified the electrified villages where one bulb in the village was a, 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 a we could tick mark it as an electrified village the definition we changed uh, and then we completed the village electrification and then still 90% of the households were not connected but still we classified them as electrified uh, villages that is also we corrected in a short span of 17 months 26.3 million households we connected to the grid so well the question is do they all get electricity every day do they get quality electricity 24 uh, 7 no but that, that is also we will do we, we, we have last 15 years what we have done is a great journey and very few parallels in the world what we have done considering that it's not a small country like vietnam or thailand or sri lanka or any, any of them none, none of those countries even uh, coming equivalent to even an average size state in india so we are talking about 1.3 billion people our utilities are servicing them and with the 95 percent of the distribution companies owned by respective state governments ruled by a different combination of political parties it's not a small challenge which uh, any consultant can write eh? so i've been seeing a lot of uh, uh, questions in the chat box so that prompt me to make that comment so look at that 99.9 percent .9 of the households are connected 690,000 villages we have done we have issues and on a bigger scale on the atnc losses which rajiv talked about yes uh, if you go back to 2004 when we had first time looked at what is this atnc losses we got a number of something like 36.36 percent something or 36.35 percentage today the uh, the uh, all india number we are somewhere at 17.23 percentage less than 50 percent of what it was 15 years ago that's a great achievement considering that 1200 billion units of electricity we are consuming every year at, at that 15 percentage of that 1200 billion which we have saved is a great number we have not invested to that extent in uh, to achieve those but uh, as again Rajiv was rightly said uh, eight or ten states account for almost 70 80 percent of that losses whose losses are more than 30 to 40 percentage 
yes the, the, in those states even today the land share of the losses are uh, technical losses i see 11 kv lines running 100 kilometers uh, some of the places more than 100 kilometers we have something like 500 million wire joints i've been taking this issue uh, in many places in the past we had done the distribution line the the lt line joints 500 million joints every second we are losing five five to ten watts of electricity on that and those are all twisted pair wire joints which are not crimped joints but the later last five years whatever rural electrification and other work which you are doing we have decent joints so we need to look at correcting the stlt ratio uh, uh, correcting the phase imbalance correcting the wire joints uh, upgrading the system uh, wherever it's overloaded all these things we need to do in some of the states it's not all 28 states and nine union territories we need to do that today it's only identified few union territories and seven eight states that correction we need to do it on fast track then coming to the what has happened in the last five six months it's it in a way for utilities on the financial side they are finding it extremely difficult but on the other side the business practices side they are all going to paperless now and these are the same people I, this is not only uh, applying to the electricity distribution companies is applying to entire uh, businesses including government and uh, banks the, the people who insisted on four signature and a rubber stamp on it but without that they did nothing today a simple email or a electronic uh, message is sufficient for them this is a great opportunity for all these people to change their business processes into digitalization and from last eight nine years we have been advocating for digitalization we have been advocating utilities to have a roadmap for uh, a digitalization very few utilities came forward and they did it and those who have done it whenever their managing director changed with a new babu and the old roadmap gone to dustbin so again it started from the zero so there are a couple of major issues which we need to do uh, uh, the most of my comments are uh, related to not to the private discounts but to the government discounts we have to look at having permanent uh, pr management you know the, the the typically the managing director or the cmds they are there for two years or less than two years in some states some states they two and a half years and the principal secretary who are their bosses the principal secretary energy they are also there for one year or two year both of them together for a board meeting maximum for board meeting nothing get decided during that four four board meetings of their common tenor i'm seeing it every day from state after state after state and the states which have made progress major progress in terms of atnc loss reduction in operational efficiencies are all states where the same leadership was there whether it's an engineer from the engineering side or from the bureaucracy it doesn't matter background doesn't matter ownership doesn't matter management matter there was a permanency of management whichever state you look at it last 10 years wherever there was a senior leadership team continued there for four years five years that's the places where a major performance improvement happened this digitalization part i again underscore that they need to have a digitalization or a transformation roadmap which is the most important thing and that should be approved by the board and irrespective of the change of their uh, principal secretary or the chairman of the board or the managing director that they should follow that board and regulator should make it uh, them accountable for following such roadmaps and from the APD, many of these people again the numbers which you are talking about whether it is 36 percent losses i talked about in 2004 whether that was correct or the today 17 percent is correct we don't know these are all accumulated meter reading uh, numbers across a year so a customer number is taken in one month or two months in some utilities so the, no time stamped data we have it's a monthly or a bi-monthly energy accounting which you have done across different systems in one utility itself none of these fellows other than the small private discounts nobody else have one billing system each one of them have two three four billing systems so you can never do an energy accounting you can come to a real number where your losses are 14 percentage or 35 percentage couple of percentage here and there that is one thing which we have been advocating for long time that we, there has to be one billing system uh, in 2018 uh, someday in um, uh, early june or end of may ministry of power the distribution department uh, they held a, a, a brainstorming session of of all the think tanks for a full day for the suggestions consultation public consultations on what should be the next round of distribution reforms and all of them had different ideas and they were given 
ten days for people to put it in writing and give it. We had given some twenty-one different points. So many of the points some of, are still relevant and need to be addressed. Some of them which I already told. And another biggest problem for this government on the discourse is the procurement process. I often say that we will always be a developed country unless we see a, a, a strategy to move away from the L1 bidding. In every bidding, how much you do, QC, BC, or 80%, 20%, whatever you do, there will be some people who will manage to get a qualifying certificate from a language which you cannot read, and an experience certificate from places which uh, no way you can cross check, and they will get through, and they will get qualified, and they will put an unworkable price, they will supply equipment which will not function, and as a result, every time we have been going this L1 business, L1 business should, we have to move. And on the power quality today, every equipment which you have at home, you have digital, digital equipment which require high quality power. And the quality of power is something which has been completely an subject. We need to work on that. Discoms need to work on that. And uh, training and capacity building is another major area. In RAPDRP, there was 52,000 crore rupees which was allocated for uh, the network improvement, the IT automation systems, there are only 200 crore rupees for training and capacity building, out of which even half of it they couldn't spend in that six or seven years. I, we have been advocating any new technology, any new systems which you do, at least 5% of the budget should customarily go for training and capacity building of the employees of the discoms or the utility. And those fellows who have been trained should be kept there until their next two level of people are trained, despite promotion or retirement, they should be held there, those who are trained. So there are many things like that. We, the, we, you heard a lot about uh, distributed generation resources, proliferating or the distribution grid, as well as electric vehicles. These two are going uh, to increase only, it is not going to come down. Last uh, three years consistently, we have added more renewable energy than the, 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 the traditional power. And our RE cost has come well below three rupees. Recently, we had the round the clock, that's a misnomer actually, but RTC uh, bid in end of May, the companies who have won, is also a 2 rupee 90 paise. So 2 rupee 90 and 2 rupee 91 paise. This, so no new capacity addition from coal or gas or any other means is not going to be economically competitive or viable in this scenario. And we have to have more systems in the distribution grid where all these problems are when the large wind farms and solar farms which are being added, there is green corridor, there are many REMCs, many other things which you have done, but the, on the distributed generation which are smaller uh, capacity, rooftop PV and other things which are connected to the low voltage and medium voltage grid, there, is, there has been a complete negligence. And two years ago, India Smart Grid Forum took up a study on the 40 gigawatt of rooftop solar which is in the target of 175 gigawatt RE by 2022, we did a study what it takes to integrate that 40 gigawatt of uh, rooftop solar. And uh, as you know, that's an area where we are actually lagging behind. The uh, achievement is less than 10%, whereas in other area we have done exceedingly well. So this RTPV, if we have to really integrate with the medium voltage and low voltage grid, we need about 10 gigawatt hour of energy storage. And when we started the study, we examined all energy storage technologies but we came to the conclusion that it's batteries which are going to be most optimal, most competitive. It can be faster deployment and it can be removed. We, we looked at three places at the substation level, at the distribution transformer level, at the customer end. Three places for this battery to be deployed. Each of them can be as the distribution grid becomes more and more stronger in the rural areas. We can ship them to other applications in other regions of the grid. So we strongly recommended, there was some question of that, uh, in, in, in the chat box also. We strongly recommended to the regulators and the ministries that look at battery storage, which is going to be cheaper today. 87% price came down in last 10 years and in, by 2025, the price will again half. We will go well below $100 per kilowatt hour. So nothing else, no technology will be able to beat at any time in the next 10, 15 years on battery storage and the life of this battery is also increasing. So we, we have talked about performance-based uh, regulation which is uh, business process re-engineering and uh, also a right to electricity act. As you know, about 70 to 80,000 megawatt of large DG set is still on the system, still on the system. People are still buying because of the unreliability of the distribution grid in many places. So many states, those are still there. And 
every kilowatt hour of electricity from the dg set is still 15 16 rupees all those people who are relying on that beat an industry or a, a gated community or a commercial building they are all willing to pay the true cost of electricity they need not be at the regulated price of 6 rupees or 8 rupees they will be happy to pay that 10 rupees or 12 rupees i as a customer i don't want a inverter i don't want a dg set i am prepared to pay 10 rupees please charge me but give me 24 7 i have a right to have that electricity so i we have been advocating for that right to electricity act go back to the village person who has nothing who has to buy Uh, uh, kerosene to li- uh, light for two hours in the evening. For him also, as a percentage of his income, it's a much higher cost for him for his energy need compared to other people who are getting electricity uh, at a regulated price. So we have to r- rationalize this. And on the franchise part, we have been advocating that the franchise should not be only for the smart cities or for the urban areas. It has to be the complete district or an, a larger area. where rural and urban both has been given to the same franchisee we cannot go on socializing the lost as well as prof- the, 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 the privatizing the profit and socializing the losses It, that paradigm will not work we have to give out a larger area for on franchisee mode and this is a great opportunity for and the lastly last i, I will stop at uh, one more point the biggest problem my electricity this is common for both private and uh, 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 government people they don't know their customer unfortunately the electricity bill the meter is in the name of the landlord or the owner of the land i stay in a house here in hoskas the land was sold by somebody 25 years ago to a builder who built a house and sold it to each uh, uh, floor and it is serviced by a at least that's 18 years serviced by a private discom my landlord name is kabur the owner of name is dadalani who owned the land and the builder is nowhere ever every floor the bill still comes in the name of dadalani it does i get an email that's a different thing the same is the case all across the country 70% of the people who do not own their own apartment or their business the shop or the businesses the electricity bill goes to the owner and here on a new electricity bill we are talking about direct benefit transfer the dbt will go to somebody who doesn't even exist they have died several years ago and it has been a major struggle in getting this electricity bill in and we have been advocating in this last uh, brainstorming also we told link the uh, all the people today you have a aadhar at least an aadhar number is required for doing anything today so aadhar number link to the electricity con- uh, num- number con- connection number and give it to all of them so uh, in the gas in everything else it is directly to the customer electricity is still not to the customer it is a land owner this is a major change which we need to do in this digital era and as far as the digitalization is con- con- concerned yes that's the way forward all the distributed resources and the electric vehicle they are all going to be sitting on the distribution grid it can be managed properly only through digital technologies and for which there has to be a digitalization or a transformation road map and all this utilities should look at that seriously thank you thank you thank you reji i'm i'm sitting on a forum with you after several years <laughs> you still haven't you know you still haven't got over your passion that you bring <laughs> electricity reform i can see it see it still raging inside you <laughs> from, from stormy reji let us go to ever calm and ever patient shall up Srivastav, who has given up a career in a long career in consulting, to work now in the social impact industry. So, Shalab, your comments, please. Thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yeah, you are very audible. Thank you. So, distribution sector does not only comprise of discoms and consumers. Uh, besides the discom there is a regulator state electricity regulatory commission there is a state government which owns the discoms and all other stakeholders are dependent on these first three to be invited for example if you want to privatize private sector will become a stakeholder only if the first two invite them through a competitive process to take up a franchisee or a licensing area and so on now in this landscape of uh, not just the discom but all stakeholders and i'll talk a bit more about that i think the regulator has to play a much bigger role than they have traditionally played their ability to uh, independently set tariffs and tariff hikes is very important 
uh, in a timely fashion. Uh, there's a mindset issue around that. So the reverse correlation between loss uh, reduction and tariff is, is probably not out of choice, but out of compulsion. Wherever the losses are high, regulators had no choice but to increase tariff in order to recover some little bit of more, more cash for the discount finances. Wherever the regulators could get away with good low tariff trajectory, uh, low loss, loss trajectories, uh, there was a socialist populist pressure to not increase tariff. So I, my problem is partly with the tariff, but partly with the mindset. The mindset that let's give it cheap, let's keep it low. I don't think that mindset betrays the mindset of a consumer of the 21st century, even in India, at least not in the urban industrial areas. There are consumers who are paying power backup uh, prices at much higher tariffs simply because they want un uninterrupted power supply. And you're clubbing all of them with the same brush when you say that, oh, let, let's keep the tariff low. Similar mindset is betrayed when privatization is taken up. The state governments first uh, intuitive reaction, Pavlovian response is to minimize the profit that the private partner can make. Now, if you're trying to minimize, reduce, eliminate the profit, why will any private sector player ever come in? The first principle of the market is that every player needs to make a reasonable profit, not guaranteed profit, reasonable potential profit subject to his own performance to improve and turn around. But the state governments have a mindset, the bureaucrats at the helms of the affairs and the uh, ministerial powers that we have a mindset that let's squeeze the private sector play, especially if it's a fresh privatization. Unlike CESC and Tata Power and BACS, if it's a fresh uh, privatization happening, the, uh, the rigmarole is around bidding document. How do we make this bidding document, standard bid document, SBD? And we have heard speakers say that every state has a different problem. Every state has a different loss problem. It has a different uh, meterization problem. It has a different consumer mix, uh, different uh, landscape and terrain. Then how can we have one standard bidding document, which or, or the concept, not the document itself, but the concept of a standard bidding process. Uh, Reji talked about the fact that we will never become a developed country unless we chuck L1 and QCBS out of our blood and DNA. I completely agree. So my suggestion, counter suggestion to that is, uh, wherever there is a complex procurement like privatization of a DISCOM, it should be Swiss challenge. Let one proponent study the whole DISCOM and present his case. And that becomes the original uh, uh, initial idea. And then everybody else can respond to that, make a apple to apple comparison and the government can bid it out in a competitive manner. And in case there are no reasonably well qualified serious players to counter it, it goes to the original proponent, period. I don't think this obsession with L1 slash low tariff slash high subsidy is going to get us anywhere in near future. That's my first uh, suggestion. And the second related suggestion is wherever procurement is not as complex as privatization, it's more of a commodity procurement like meters and software and ERP and network and cables and conductors. It should still not be L1 or QCBS, it should be T1. T1 means the government declares a budget. It does not go about discovering price through the market. It declares its own budget. And vis-a-vis -vis that budget, whosoever scores technically the highest gets awarded. The competition is on your technical ability to serve and deliver the discom and not on your ability to squeeze down your prices through whichever way, right or wrong. That's my second suggestion. Another question was asked, what are the sources of funding? How will the discoms under such financial stress anyways do any kind of transformation? The short answer is those who are really under bad shape, financial health, the only way out is privatization. You need to have a PPP model which works, sustains and endures because the capital infusion cannot come from the government sources beyond a point. Yes, PSUs maybe, but by and large, it's a corporate sector with a private or, or, or PSUs which will need to be attracted to invest and take up uh, either licensing or franchising mechanisms. I personally prefer licensing because it also pins the responsibility of power procurement on the management of the DISCOM and therefore on the private sector management control person rather than separating it out and just giving franchise of the operations. But that still can be uh, debated uh, either ways. The other sector where private sector is very, very important, the other segment where private sector is very, very important is manufacturing. Today, we are importing most of our meters, uh, panels, uh, electric vehicles, batteries, uh, electricity efficient devices like LEDs. If we are all going to import all of this and, and, and from countries where we specifically don't want to import given the recent developments, we need to have private sector manufacturers and private sector domestic manufacturing segment 
also grow up in tandem with generators and distributors uh, from the corporate side. It's not in isolation that only distribution as a function can be privatized and there is no matching uh, investment and uh, evolution of the domestic manufacturing sector in India. Uh, last question that I want to address, which was raised by Gaurav is what should be the investment priorities? In my view, the priority number one for all discoms and including especially the government discoms should be employees. They need to train, refresh, rehire, recruit, reinvent, reskill their employees, both on technical side, on customer orientation and service in terms of from basic conduct to operating computers to uh, uh, fetching data from smart meters, from making sense of big data analytics, unless the employee on the ground all the way from lineman to the managing director is completely upskilled and upgraded to the current state of affairs where uh, electricity business has reached globally, nothing else will move. In any other sector, employees have been dealt with a much better deal than we have. In our electricity distribution sector, employee can make much more money by not doing what he's supposed to do off the ground, off the field. And that equation has to be tilted. It has to be uh, reversed in the manner where employees are empowered, both held accountable for, but then also motivated and rewarded for doing their duty uh, in a in in a, in a ethical manner and competent manner. Priority number two is technology. Number one is employees. Number two is technology. Thankfully, training employees doesn't cost much in terms of money. It costs a lot more in terms of mindset. Uh, technology, however, is capital intensive. The reason I say technology is important as the second most uh, vital investment priority is because I'm referring to embedded technologies which make any distribution network smart, intelligent, and automated. That's like the nervous system of a body. So we've been investing in bones and muscles without really developing nervous system and brain uh, of the distribution infrastructure. If we have, so let's present the uh, reverse scenario. If we have a good uh, embedded technologies across smart grid, smart metering, ERP, billing, customer care, uh, energy audit, and so on, what all will it enable, which we are currently missing out? Things like you want to do carriage and content separation to enhance competition. You can't do it unless your data is up to date. Your network assets are adequately mapped. Your consumers are rightly indexed. Your input output energy are exactly reconciled to the extent possible on near real time basis. So even to do that, and, and I, I can see why it's not there in the uh, amendment to the Electricity Act. Technology wise, we are not uh, as yet uh, uh, you know, uh, geared up to implement. Now it's a, it's a moot point whether the push comes first or the investment comes first and that can be debated either ways. Second is smart metering and net metering. Unless we have uh, uh, and prepaid billing, all three are related to the fact that we need to have smart grids and smart meters in place. Without this, none of these will push off in the way that uh, they should be. Uh, third is TOD tariff. If you want to your tariff to penetrate far, wide and deep across to almost as many consumers as is possible, maybe with the exception of Lifeline, or, or some kind of a subvention thereof, all of that will again need smart metering. Now, today smart meter is compared with a static meter, static meter is compared with an electromechanical meter, and that is compared with the option of having no meters at all. If that's how we look at it, obviously smart meters will appear expensive. The only way they will uh, appear cost effective is that we believe that that's the only option going forward, and they have to be manufactured domestically, and they have to be implemented at scale, like ESL model of, uh, procurement or whichever model of procurement which doesn't rely on L1. And finally, things like power quality. So unless we are measuring SIDI, SIFI, KIFI at, uh, at the nodal grassroots level down to the LT level of network, there is no way that power quality will get measured, quantified, and eventually uh, you know rewarded. So uh, again, goes back to technology, goes back to tech infrastructure and digital infrastructure to be able to enable a lot of these process reforms. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you, Shalab, uh, for for uh, being very succinct and uh, also touching upon areas you know which others have not talked about. So very useful. Uh, we have had a full comprehensive round with lot of discussion and rich detail, uh, but we are you know uh, 45 minutes behind schedule. So so first of all, I would like to request you know. If we can extend this discussion, maybe for at least 30 minutes, uh, we have a lot of, you know, participants and a lot of questions uh, to, to field. Uh, I know Rajib uh, perhaps has to leave uh, and, and uh, we have a second round uh, 
you know, uh, so I would like maybe to start with Rajiv and have a very quick two minutes intervention before he leaves for another meeting. Uh, and then next, uh, Mr. Padmanabhan, uh, followed by Anjali. I think uh, we'll have a short second round with only three panelists uh, and then go to Q&A directly. So Rajiv, uh, before you leave, uh, maybe a quick couple of points. Thank you, Varun. Uh, something which was very interesting, 360 degree we could cover. That means right from uh, the point uh, we started, what are the pain points for distribution uh, to the uh, regulatory issues, uh, to the issues where uh, whether the distribution companies are really utilizing the market and how uh, the benefits uh, can be passed down to the co consumers. Everything has been covered. But the most important thing which I could not cover during my uh, short presentation was uh, why discoms or uh, are not participating or getting the full benefit of the uh, market, which uh, Mr. Niyogi tried to uh, touch upon uh, that the cost of power procurement uh, seems to be something which is uh, the most significant. If you would like to have the operational efficiency of uh, the discoms, but the most interesting thing is how much operational efficiency they can garnish at this point of time when uh, the 90 percent of their power procurement is tied up on a long-term ppa and they can get the benefit as soon as we we see some numbers from the market coming that the during the COVID period the the prices in the short-term market or the exchanges have come down to a level of two rupee 40 pesa uh, rtm uh, uh, that is not being reflected in the actual tariff which goes to the benefit of the customer. And this is something which is very interesting because the liquidity or the depth of the uh, market today in Indian condition is really, really very shallow. And uh, we need to deepen it further if the benefit has to go to the DISCOM and particularly to the end consumers at the last. Of course, uh, Salab was very right in saying that many of the large scale reforms like carriage and content separation or, or major reforms, which we have been discussing for so long, uh, is not being uh, contemplated right now. But there are many reforms which are being discussed. And let me tell you, uh, the last four years, 2016 to 2020, we have seen major reforms in terms of tariff policy, in terms of uh, the, the new regulations in the Power market 2010 on anvil and many more things which are coming uh, so that the market uh, can get the benefit the, the discounts can get the benefit of uh, the market but certainly we have to relook how the power procurement and the portfolios of the discounts are being managed at this point of time there has to be a scientific way of forecasting measuring analyzing and then procuring uh, best from the market and then, the, then only they can get the best out of uh, the market what we have today. So with these words, I would like to just uh, uh, get uh, permitted. Rajiv, attending. Yeah, please. Rajiv if, I may, Rajiv, if I may just ask you one last question before you leave. Uh, what is uh, PTC's intent behind planning to set up a third exchange? So is how do discounts benefit from that? Uh, Gaurav, you, you are very right. Right now, if you see, there is no competition in exchange. Virtually 98-99% of the total exchange day and market and the, the RTM market is with one exchange. I'll not like to name the exchange, but that is uh, with one exchange. And uh, if you really see in the last 10 years, 2010, uh, the power market regulation came into being and virtually we are having only two products which are operating in the last 10 years. Virtually for eight, nine years, there was only one product which was a day ahead market, uh, which was operating and which could get only 4% of the market. So if there is no competition, there is no innovation and new products cannot be introduced. PTC would like to, I mean, I'll not say PTC, it's an exchange which is uh, jointly promoted by Bombay Stock Exchange, ICICI and PTC and uh, of course uh, the other market operators. So they would like to bring something uh, which will be innovative, uh, which is uh, friendly for uh, the, the, the distribution companies and other consumers, industrial consumers, because it is not one product which is going to serve for everyone, including some of the merchant uh, renewable, 
which we are uh, trying to discuss for last so many years but we could not bring so there are many products including cross border trade and other issues which which we were discussing mr padmanaban is uh, leading this for the last so many years we we are discussing we are participating in the discussions in various forums usaid forums but we could not convert into a product so we we strongly believe that uh, there has to be active players in the market who can bring innovative products for the benefit of all thank you thank you rajiv so much i know you have another meeting starting maybe now so we appreciate your taking time and uh, i understand you have to leave thank you so thank much you rajiv thank you other panelists yeah. and i'm really uh, grateful that you could you could accommodate me in exiting the uh, for attending the other meeting thank you god uh i'll next you know request mr padmanaban to you know uh, make comments you know on irp expand little bit what he he was talking about and also i think uh, there have been uh, some thoughts on tariff rationalization and specifically you know Uh, on the google side how does his concept of energy productivity links with what what we heard from other panelists uh, thank you garav can you hear me yes please go ahead yeah uh, the last time i was very brief because i took it very seriously that you should not take more than 5 minutes i'll be brief this time too um thanks for the two questions that you asked um, IRP is not a uh, ploy to get the state to intervene through the back door and perform the power sector reform work as done in the past the idea really is to provide the regulatory commissions with the ability and oversightedness required to strategically direct the sector to move in a particular direction um irp uh, in fact even in deregulated utilities uh, abroad uh, irp is seen as, uh, sanjeev just to uh, address your point that we might probably be getting the state to come back again to the back door to control the sector uh, that probably is a little mis is the purpose and intent of our sector reform the utility and to some extent that has been achieved and that ought to continue um, and this is not in any way to strengthen the ability of the state to control the functions of the utility but definitely to strengthen the ability of regulatory commissions to provide need to be pushed and prodded to move towards energy efficiency and demand side management and probably one way they could do that is to get the evidence on the table that these measures on deficiency and dsm are more cost effective than for them to buy from make those kinds of arguments and to put is extremely important and that's why i had suggested in the first round that we ought to make irp a mandate uh, a mandate so that it is seen as some principle which the utility sector has to follow the second point uh, gaurav you mentioned uh, Uh, about pricing and productivity now the 800 pound gorilla in the room and we heard it from mr niyogi and we heard it from several others uh, is uh, power supply to agriculture we know it is subsidized and we know that pricing is convoluted that the industrial sector ends up paying the most for power which is the cheapest for them to receive in terms of cost of supply and agriculture is precisely the reverse this is very well known but for a moment if you look at the industrial sector and the willingness and ability of the industrial sector to pay for the power one of the reasons why the industrial sector pays 
much more for the power than it costs the utility to deliver to them is because the industrial sector is a value added sector it's a manufacturing sector it is expected that this sector would recover the cost of energy from the cost of the product which they sell so that's how that kind of business operates now if you were to use that thinking and that strategy for the agricultural sector for a moment and see whether we can improve the revenue of that the farmer will be in a position to pay for the power that he gets from the utility now what that really means is that the farmer needs to engage or be engaged in value addition which is of a higher order than what it is today what that translates itself into is energy productivity of consumed in farm to produce a product which enables the farmer to make a profit and pay for the electricity similarly to what industry does now this may appear to be very far fetched but this is the direction in which we ought to be moving where we look at energy productivity rather than looking at energy efficiency through the kind of interventions we are talking about so the kind of question that we need to ask is not so much how energy is used in farms but what is it used for now how, how energy is used in farms is a question that we have been asking all these years and we know the answer it is used inefficiently we know the responses to that we know the way to reduce uh, t at and c losses in the supply of power to farms uh, it was all mentioned in the earlier speakers uh, Yes, the question related to reconducting, the question related to HT by LT ratios, the question related to uh, improved efficiency of pump sets, and even digitization of uh, power supply through smart motors and smart pump systems, and so on and so forth. These are very well known. They need to be done. They need to kind of reduce the losses. But in spite of all of that, tariffs are subsidized and they are low. So the question is. how do we ensure that the tariffs are connected to the revenue generating ability of the farmer in terms of the produce that he produces through diversification modernization and so on and so forth now the kusum scheme is a case in point it's a good example in the kusum scheme your solarization of pump sets providing solar power through um, uh, solar power systems to enable the farmer to sell power to the grid or to sell power to other entities in the neighboring area in other words don't look at it so much as solar power but look at it from the point of view of the ability of the farmer to earn more when he starts earning more he is willing to pay for the power so this is the kind of thinking that we need to now start introducing in order to address this pernicious issue of subsidies um we cannot do away with subsidies but at the same time recognize that the subsidy is the single largest element creating the problems to the power sector in terms of fiscal deficit of the state and in terms of the inability of the state to cover the costs related to energy losses so these were the two points i wanted to make and i thought in the context of the change that we are looking at in the distribution sector in addition to all the details that we heard earlier these were the two broad strategic details i thought i like to put on the table the one on irp which i think need to be mandated and another is looking at energy productivity as a way to determine the farm tariffs in order to reduce the element of subsidy that that's all i had to say so that's you are all i have to say at this point because Thank you. i think that the okay sir you are on mute we can't hear you on mute so mr padmanabhan thank you he's already left but let's thank oh thank you uh, mr padmanabhan for that detailed uh, explanation of that very alarming you know suggestion that you gave in the earlier session that we should bring back planning into the electricity act it raised hackles all around from all the <laughs> forms but now we better understand 
and what you actually meant. So thank you for that. Very grateful. Um, sadly, uh, we are going to be uh, having Shalab Shivastav also go away for another prefix appointment. Shalab, if you have a minute, I wanted to ask you to, if you have a minute, you know, I wanted to just ask you about this wonderful experiment that you are doing in Rajasthan, uh, which is very uh, enigmatically named as Empower Gains. Uh, it sounds very really attractive and I for one don't know what that initiative is and what it means. And I think there would be many who would be in the same boat as me. So could you take a minute before you go just to enlighten us on what is that initiative and how far has it reached? Sure. Uh, as, as was pointed out uh, by Rajiv Mishra, Rajasthan is probably contributing highest to that loss portfolio of India probably or one of the highest. So it's, it's, it's a small initiative that we've started recently. So it's at experimental stages, but the concept is not experimental underlying it. Empower Gains simply stands for employee ownership based gain sharing model. Employee ownership means we take a state uh, owned discom and a small segment within that, maybe a division or a subdivision. We look at the employees who are actually running the show on the ground, who are actually doing what you call metering, billing, collection, customer service, uh, network maintenance, reliability of power, and so on, in whatever conditions they are, as is, where is basis. And within those constraints of their daily life, because that's the reality of 90% of India, right? That we are where we are and we have to make do, at least in the medium term with the resources that are available. Uh, can we simply turn around one parameter of performance and that's employee uh, skills, engagement, integrity to see what they can do. The inspiration for this came from the DISCOM uh, of Kanpur, Kesco in UP, uh, which never went through privatization, but went through a threat of privatization several years ago. And the same employees who handled Kesco uh, uh, traditionally or, or a combination of some UPPCL employees uh, deployed in that district were able to turn that around significantly vis-a-vis -vis rest of the UP. In stark contrast with Purvanchal, Pashchimanchal, etc., uh, a, a compact geography of one district with a large urban and a very small suburban area surrounding it uh, brought their losses down to this magic figure of 15-16%, which has been touted in RAP, DRP, and Uday. So what we're trying to do is take that concept in a more systemic and uh, organized manner. Every time you cannot give a threat, you have to engage people, uh, train them, make them accountable, give them a, a very different uh, performance parameters to operate than their usual time bound, tenure bound promotions and transfers and postings to very, very quantifiable parameters which go and sit into your ATNC formula. So we take the ATNC formula, take each parameter out of the numerator and denominator, allocate it to a set of employees, build them into teams and make them uh, accountable as well as uh, rewardable potentially for improving their respective metric. And then as a team, they improve the ATNC loss and some of the related customer service parameters. And let's see how that goes. We believe that short of a massive re rehaul, overhaul and, 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 and uh, major structural reforms, this kind of a slow burn process can turn around substantive uh, low hanging fruits, quick wins in a period of a couple of years. So by the time you've got your bidding document, your privatization procurement, your massive fund infusion from Aditya and Udais and so on, in these formative years, you've got something which is much more ready, ready to be sold or privatized or even to be retained in house and maybe given off to an employee cooperative two, three years down the line. So that's an experiment that we're doing. So, you know, uh, Shalab, I asked that because Rahul Patel, who is one of the participants was actually outraged by hearing you emphasize that privatization is very important for improving performance in, in distribution. And he asked you that, are you aware that there is a massive ongoing agitation against privatization in distribution subsequent to you know the recent announcement by uh, government? So I think this will give some solace to Rahul that you are not a unfeeling, relentless privatizer, ideological privatizer, but where the opportunities exist, they do exist somewhere. Where the opportunities exist, ESUs can be turned around and turned into efficient producers, but it's a tough slog. And uh, yeah, it is. You know, it requires funds and time and so on. Do you want to say something on that? 
because you yeah the point of of privatization was largely about funding how do you bring yeah. massive capital funding that's the where, where i said the compulsion is to privatize thank you i won't right. take more time right. okay thank you very much thank you over to you uh anjali uh, you know if you are there uh, you know you couldn't complete your comments and uh, specifically i wanted to ask you you know uh, we are talking about privatization here and uh, how does ifc look at potentially supporting uh, private sector companies uh, in terms of acquiring you know some companies which may be ready to be divested uh, particularly in urban areas union territories which the current government of india plan is so so are you all available interested and if yes what are the you know indicators which you will look at go, go, add another question for anjali anjali can i add another question which has come from one of the participants uh, kinshuk chaturvedi wants to know and i think you are the best person to kind of uh, tell him the ground situation he wants to know that you know we are now moving towards net zero the target of net zero by 2040 i think and what he wants to know is that what is the competency level of individuals and utilities in the country both private and public to address the concerns with arise from walking along this path so this is this would be something that ifc would be closely associated with because of the climate agenda so maybe you could touch on that also how future ready are we is that varav is anjali there anjali i can see you are there you are on mute so we can't hear you no it seems that you know the technical glitch at our hand anjali sorry can you hear me now yes yes we can, can see you me. and we can hear you now so go ahead anjali sorry guys can you Shall we ask Reggie some questions while Anjali fixes herself? Yeah. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, Anjali, go ahead. Sorry, I'm I'm using three devices and it's still not working. Uh, so, Gaurav, very quickly on your second question on IFC's interest, absolutely. Uh, as I said earlier, also. i feel definitely interested in the space and corporatization and privatization is the path that we are expecting uh, distribution companies in india to go forward on especially with the current uh, discussions which are happening and if that happens then we are able to address you know the risk and uh, it the uh, due diligence which comes with it this is absolutely a sector that we would want to operate in and it will be case by case uh, basis so that's the is point to your second question i want to quickly go and make a point on uh, you know there's been a lot of discussion on what happens external to discom but i think it's also important for the distribution companies to start thinking ahead to start thinking of the future and to actually look at themselves as a business and a case in point there is the whole access uh, discussion which is happening so with 100% electrification you know the impact or the amount that they need to buy or supply is really minimal it's not uh, anything which has a huge impact but if you look at the policy the intent of the policy and the expectation and some of you may have also read mr rk singh's interview in the indian express two days ago he is expecting you know this to really scale up for these households to buy a lot of products going forward and if this really happens then it should happen because that's the right path for the country to go on what is the impact on distribution company finances if they do not do anything right now uh, you know most most people who would have visited rural markets would know that maximum number of appliances which are available in these rural areas are low cost inefficient and poor quality uh, 
which means that they will become guzzlers for electricity you know going forward and you know back of the envelope uh, calculations show me that the discom losses could increase anything by you know 14000 to 16000 crores and this is all discom put together and a and a, and a uh, you know if we if we buy a few uh, product going forward in the next 3 to 5 years but if we are able to move these households to efficient appliances the losses could really decline and if the additional operational efficiencies uh, you know and other other reforms come in place this could actually become a game changer but i think it's for the discoms to understand this and you know track uh, consumption track consumer behavior and work with stakeholders who are their partners uh, you know in the reform process to really create massive awareness about efficient appliances and to move their consumers in that direction so it, and it's not easy it will take uh, you know time to happen but if you don't start doing it now you'll end up in a really bad situation going forward and you know more and more uh, financial packages will be needed so that's one point that i wanted uh, to make i think to respond to sanjeev's uh, question on net zero uh, by 2040 and you know what is our level of uh, Uh, preparedness for this i think i think we are on the right path there is a lot of conversation which is happening on climate even though you know we are dealing with covid the kind of discussion that we are having as ifc with some of our clients are very very focused on climate there is a need to ramp up climate finance uh, in india and despite all the issue that we are uh, facing with you know slow down in the economic growth uh, you know that discussion hasn't come to a standstill and which is a good thing even though some of the policy that may we have seen uh, may not be uh, you know pushing us in that direction but i think it's not that we have stopped talking about it which to me uh, you know brings uh, it 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 makes me happy uh, that you know it's not that this is a closed chapter for us so i think we're on the path i think there is a lot that we can uh, achieve and i'm very optimistic about it hmm. gorav there's a question here which i thought i see that mr niyogi is back perhaps yes he is ah uh, yeah there you are so gorav can i ask uh, you know there is a gentleman here who is a participant sc kangere who is director of the ice group so the question sir he has for you is that why is uh, why why when will india's policy makers understand that small communally owned micro grids that focus on self generation and energy storage reduce transmission and distribution costs while delivering a net zero carbon solution under net zero consumer billing conditions in a full circle net zero waste economy when will we is this something that we should be looking at mr niyogi in distribution the answer is yes uh, because uh, given the expanse vast expanse of the country you know decentralized uh, generation and power supply does occupy a, a space it's not that it's not happening it's finding it's 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 about finding the economies of scale and how to make the business model that would evolve as being sustainable now is it in terms of uh, rural sub power supply and building micro grids it would be knowing that you know uh, there are some uh, collaborations that are taking place already and it has taken roots in states like bihar up and orissa now what basically are the challenges the challenges are yes you know you are remote from the grid right but the challenges are basically centered around the economic scalability now if if i build a grid then who are the takers what basically would be their base their income level of supporting a price which will sustain the business cost of delivering electricity now what what can possibly transpire in future and 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 basically the models that are being tried out are premised on recovering a fixed charge so it's 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 no way near the economic price of electricity but uh, you know when you compare to the grid cost of delivery power but you know it it it's it at least gives you the reliability now as far as micro grids are concerned you see basically unless the rural economy or the or the local economy uh, to be more particular that 
improves. So unless you have given them some opportunities of income generation, unless you are able to support micro enterprises, which again will require the broader support of micro financing institution. So it is the entire ecosystem of a local economy that needs to be propped up. And one of the issues also is like, you know, Patuna, Mr. Patwana mentioned that the Kusum scheme uh, is a harbinger of change. So if you, it, it is also, you know, a measure of generating rural income. So unless you are able to do that, provide some kind of, uh, uh, you know, foundation on which the income streams can be built, it is very difficult to sustain the business models which go along with microgrids. The fact of the matter is it is being tried out. We are scaling it up. Policymakers do have an understanding uh, that, you know, the microgrids could be the answer in remote areas, especially in difficult areas, you know, where uh, it is not very economical to take the grid along. So it's been tried out, but the basic challenge remains of supporting the local community with generation of income streams that in turn will support their livelihoods. Okay. Mr. Niyogi, uh, a follow-on question from another participant, Mr. Jayan Prasad. He asks, what is the, what is the hesitation in expanding time of day pricing to say plus minus 50%. I think a more broader point being, you know, uh, shouldn't the peak prices reflect the marginal cost of generation uh, at that point in time? And why can't distribution companies and regulators do that? Because, you know, of course, people who are consuming at that point in time, uh, you know, are generally at the higher end. Uh, using air conditioners or other such such appliances, and maybe you know after you, Mr. Padmanabhan's perspective also on the same point uh, would be very interesting. See that uh, presently, how is the time of day uh, regime is structured? You know, we we have uh, essentially a, a pricing for for the regular period, a pricing for the peak period, and the pricing for the non-peak period. The differentiation is not much. Now, in order to have a regimented uh, structure of time of day uh, pricing, you need a few things. One is the, the basic awareness that what it means in order to have energy efficiency at my backyard. And why it is also not happening, it's a related point, I'll digress a bit, it's because we really haven't seen the discounts or the utility being present behind the meter. Uh, which is uh, which is you know b b one way of supporting your uh, b business model at, uh, as and when uh, you know you migrate to to a regime of flat to declining load. So that's one. But the awareness is not there that energy efficiency could be a productive means, and uh, the awareness is also not there on the discom side, as Mr. Padran keeps saying that energy efficiency is the the first fuel. So that's one. Two, you know, in order to structure, you know, a regimented uh, tariff regime, uh, uh, ta ta tariff uh, uh, construct of a uh, time of day uh, pricing. See, you also need a corresponding market which will basically try to price power according to the hour of usage. Now we do not have that kind of a sophistication of a market model being developed that power can be priced on an hourly basis, especially, you know, per factor in the critical peak pricing, unless, you know, that there are, uh, you know, per takers of such power. So the market, first of, of, of all, the, the market of power delivery has to have a construct and then only in downstream, you can have a consumer uh, awareness of what hourly pricing would eventually be, uh, may mean in terms of uh, employing the economics of uh, power usage and you know uh, the the intelligent way of uh, calibrating your power consumption. The other uh, you know uh, the other I won't say bottleneck, but the the other hurdle you know we have to cross is uh, as uh, Mr. Pillai was saying that you know there is also the necessity of bringing in the concept of 
the internet of things so which will lead to more sophistication in your personal energy management it will generate sales of options and then as a consumer being aware you will take the advantage of dynamic pricing so you know again it's if i may come back it's it's an ecosystem of building consumer awareness having a power supportive power market which will uh, which will uh, which will which will have uh, hourly pricing as one of the key components and then you know an enabling measure of iot uh, which will enable the intelligent usage of equipment Uh, you, you know, one of the points that has always puzzled me for very many years is the fact that we have not been able to introduce TOD pricing, and we have also not been able to introduce interruptible tariffs. And there are very good reasons for some of it, as Niyogi very rightly explained. But having said that, I think it is time now that we look at the the ability. for our utilities to exercise these functions in order to manage these loads so followed routinely by utilities abroad as i mentioned earlier load research i think is extremely important we have a lot of data now being accumulated in our utilities because many of our grids are being monitored and there are meters all over the place but unfortunately the data is not being put to good use other than for just billing and so on and maybe some kind of a rudimentary audit energy balance but we need to go much beyond that we need to use this data to develop the rationale for tod pricing develop the rationale for peak load management develop the rationale for load shifting and so on we have not done so and i guess the the point that mr niyogi mentioned that the market may not be ready the people are not aware at least consumers are not aware are definitely constraints but they ought not to come in the way of us at least planning at a pilot scale a large scale tod uh, tariff determination as well as its application for certain sectors as you rightly said the industrial sector which pays for uh, uh, you know pays the, the the cost of supply and more than the cost of supply and who also contribute to some extent to the peak load could also be uh, entities which we could target we could also entity we could also target uh, customers in the high end who use air conditioners and so on and so forth and will be in ability to pay the higher tariffs as required for a tod and maybe it's 25% greater 50% greater than the average tariff and that has to be seen but i think it is time that we don't kind of fall back on any kind of excuses and go in for a tod tariff uh, in in one or the other discom test it out validate it prove it and then others can replicate it thank you thank you Hi. mr patnabhan the two interrelated questions vijay right, i'm coming to you Vijay, I am coming like to you. To, on this point, I like to add. Tod is. Sure, uh, please it, allow me a moment to pose two questions, and you can also answer for that. So there are two very interesting questions from our participants. One, Omar Zada, and second, Rakesh Kandwa, asking what is the impact of solar PV uh, on distribution, and the second one asking what is the impact of electric vehicle charging infrastructure on distribution system. I wanted to pose both of these questions to you, AJ, and also please uh, feel free okay. to add. Okay. So I'll, I'll I'll start with the, thank you very much. I'll start with the uh, TOD part. TOD uh, for high volume customers being given in many states, which were not a uh, uh, because of inadequacy in metering infrastructure, it never worked. Maharashtra started with six uh, time frame, sometime in some day in two thousand two or two thousand four. Nowhere it could be done. But today, TOD was a good concept when we had. majority of the generation coming from dispatchable big plants but with increasing share of renewables on the grid uh, the which are not exactly dispatchable we need to move to a real time pricing or a tou time of use pricing customer behavior is also changing you can't exactly predict when the ma maximum peak load is going to be the last 4 5 years in delhi the peak is happening in past midnight so we have to come to a A framework where we'll be able to give one hour, half an hour, half an hour price signals to 
at least a, a section of the consumers who, who have uh, loads which can be uh, shifted. So it's a TOU and ISDF is doing a, 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 a pioneering work in Gujarat. I, we have taken Gujarat as a, a state where we can do a TOU framework and that work is almost in the final stages and our uh, the model will be uh, uh, report and the model will be submitted by end of September to the regulator and to the state government. That will be a very interesting, uh, which can be replicated in other states. Why we have taken Gujarat is because of the many reasons. I won't get into it then. Coming to the impact of uh, solar on the distributed solar on the dis medium voltage and low voltage grid is it's going to be. See, today again, all any region we take, the percentage of rooftop solar is 2%, 5%, 7% in capacity. Only in California, it exceeded 20% or now more than 30%. If you look at the solar load curve, you see it going up and coming down. But if you take every minute, you can see spikes. So to smoothen solar output, you need to have storage or other uh, means on the grid. So we need, as the share of rooftop goes high, we need to have that. We have been advocating that. One best way is to integrate vehicles, electric vehicles, which are going to be connected on the same low voltage distribution grid, where the rooftop also will be connected. The vehicle battery giving the smoothening uh, uh, power to uh, smoothening services to the uh, rooftop uh, output of the so solar panels. So this is something which we need to do it. Unfortunately, no electric vehicle manufacturers so far been offering vehicle to grid service because their warranty is war uh, manufacturer is given warranty for a battery, the battery manufacturer given warranty for a particular life cycle. But if you recollect three months ago, Tesla said that 1.6 million kilometer or 1 million mile, they are going to war give you warranty for the battery. That will outlive the car actually. So in the coming days, battery, both its performance, life, everything is going to be uh, much higher and all the batteries can be of vehicle to grid services. So integration of rooftop with electric vehicles is very much essential and that's the way we have been advocating and working on the electric vehicle charging infrastructure standards which BIS is drawing. And uh, another part if you look at it, the impact of electric vehicles on the grid is going to be very very uh, major when large number of vehicles are, are charging at the same time. Whenever a, the batteries need DC current to charge the battery in the vehicle. Either you convert that inside the vehicle on a onboard AC-DC converter or through the charger, the DC fast charger which are connected to the grid. Either way, when AC is converted into DC, harmonics get injected back to the grid. And grid equipment, if not properly sized or have harmonic filters installed, power quality meters installed and power quality monitored in uh, real time, there will be major impacts. There are some incidents already happened in some parts of the country in India itself. We have studied, we have given recommendations and uh, we, we will be publishing. We are currently doing a, a, Bangalore city has the maximum number of EV charges as we speak and Buscom want to add another 150 charging stations in addition to the uh, 112 charger which they have already. And they requested ISGF to do a detailed modeling study. We have been doing lot of studies on and impact assessment on the grid on uh, 24 few days. We already completed seven or eight few days. So that again, we have seen some very interesting results coming out and uh, some other studies done in Delhi and other parts also. This is an area which utilities need to have uh, proper planning before large rollout of EV charging stations. Thank you. Sir, you want to uh, pose a few more questions before we close, maybe last couple of questions. All right, so let's... Uh... Uh, continue with Reggie because he. Oh, everybody else left. It's only me and uh, Padmanavan, sir. No, there's Anjali also there. Oh, okay. okay. Mr. Niyogi is also Mr. there. Mr. Niyogi is oh, also okay, there. Okay, okay. okay. so but sorry. This I is, this, my, my this is I'm, I'm, pose, I'm posing you a bread and butter question which you have evaded thus far. So we need a short and crisp answer from you on this. My question to you, sir, is the following that. Uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the telecom sector, they say data is the new oil, right? Now, when will data become the new oil and become a source of revenue in the, electric, in the electricity sector? Because it's an obvious source of re revenue that we are losing out on. I, I, you mentioned that, you know, our metering systems are so short. 
that the data will be clouded. Uh, whatever data we gather will be clouded by our not knowing the profile of, you know, uh, the people, the person to whom the data is attributed. And that may be in some cases, but you know, uh, surely that cannot be true for all the 240 million households of India. So when will well, the data become the new oil for electricity? I would say very soon and uh, COVID would push that even faster. Uh, Number one, uh, all the field dates uh, have been metered successfully and that metering data is available. Although not in real time, 15 minute uh, uh, interval data of the all field dates all across the country are available, which has not been put to good use. We have been advocating with the Ministry of Power and PFC that we should aggregate that and there can be analytical tools to do the load research, exactly what Mr. Palmanamin was saying, that is not being taken up at all. That's a high priority. But currently, there's a program which you would have heard in the budget speech of the finance minister also that 250 million smart meters will be introduced in the country. So that everything is ready, including the standard bidding documents. And we ho hope that this will be announced by government very soon. And that program will take three to five years, maybe seven years to complete. But at least uh, half of India will have uh, smart meters in the next three to four years. Uh, as we speak, uh, the real, real uh, uh, billing is happening only to less than 1% of the customers who have smart meters, which is only in the pilot projects and some other uh, rollout which has happened in Delhi and a couple of other cities. Other than that, 99% of the electricity customers in India after March is being given bill based on estimated consumption. You would have seen a lot of uh, uh, protests by uh, different uh, people, including celebrities uh, of inflated bill. Uh, well, employee, that, that is not exactly correct, but we are unable to give a, 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 a good bill to them, uh, a data to them that we have done meter reading. People spending more hours at home today, 24 hours at home with their air conditioner around all kinds of appliances. Earlier they were 10 hours out of the house, so their consumption has gone up, but we are unable to give them a transparent bill and capture that consumption. So this is going to be, when we have 15 minute interval data of every customer available, that will be that new oil or the new uh, revenue source for that. But there are so many other things. How the digital assets of the utilities can be leveraged for new revenue opportunities. We had uh, that, I mean, that itself is a hour long discussion. But at least the customer information, we, we talked to the city gas distribution people. We have given more than 200 cities the gas distribution license. The new gas distribution license people going to a new town. They don't know who are the customer, where do they leave address, nothing. But as an electricity company, I have everything. I have every address, their data, everything available. So we have been trying to do a marriage of this city gas distribution licenses who are new with the discoms for sharing their customer data. And later the GIS map, most of the cities, we have 1,400 towns, we have the digital map of the customers and the electricity assets. These are going to be valuable data for the anyone who is going to do new uh, uh, business in a city. Uh, and yeah. There are so many other things. Same for the water distribution people well, can be a combined bill. We have been advocating with all these people for a common bill. Electricity bill, water bill, gas bill, all this can be one in one platform, one place. So with the, um, after several years of trying, in Delhi there is an experiment with the ideas uh, in Tata Power Delhi distribution and uh, Indra Prasa gas distribution. One uh, colony, they have two colonies in fact in one block they have taken up for a combined building exercise. So there are the, the digital assets of all these people are appreciating, whereas your phys physical assets are depreciating. This is something which utilities are currently uh, 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 realizing it. Only those who have digital assets are the one who are actually today having business continuity. We are able to, many of this platform were there for last 10 years. None of us used it. After COVID, in the lockdown scenario, we are leveraging this uh, or discovered, uh, rediscovered and Leveraging this for effective. Nobody wants to go back today. Yeah. Our yeah, productivity Reggie. working from home is much higher. Yeah, Reggie. Sorry, back I, you. Back I, you. I, I need a concrete. Uh, and I, on to this, I need a short concrete answer. That you know, distribution billing is around seven trillion, and their losses are in the region of 40, 50 thousand crores. Right. So that's around uh, uh, what five? Uh, how much is it? Five percent or six percent or something? of their billing, right? Will, can data, the new oil, cover up this loss and give some profit or, or will it never 
be can, can never be valued equivalent to the loss that they are suffering today absolutely there is no rocket science this can be done they should do digitalization with a road map as i said but today typical utility has four or five billing systems and none, and, and yeah. metering system is in very poor situation particularly in the rural areas so sure. many people talk about the uh, Uh, theft and uh, electricity theft and things like that it's happening in less than 2% of the country or the as a country we are not uh, thieves 99% of the people are honest and they are committed to pay the uh, actual cost of electricity yeah, the difficult pockets are, are are very few which can be addressed separately so the utilities need to improve their processes and have commitment to make this transformation and that is possible if they do it is 2 to 3 years time the data will start becoming oil for them Okay. Uh, okay. One one last uh, question which I want to pose, and this has come from Mr. V S Ailawadi, who is a former chairman, founder chairman, in fact, of the Haryana Electricity Regulatory Commission. And I will pose this question to Mr. Niyogi. Uh, what he is asking fundamentally is, you know, there have been a lot of recommendations which have come in the past. Uh, especially from regulators you know writing a series of directives uh, to distribution companies in their tariff orders sometimes some elsewhere uh, but but you know the change has not happened and you know what he he makes a point that you know the the distribution companies are state owned they are monopoly and unless you know this changes um, and that's where i think the intention of the the government uh, to privatize you know the union territories now so so uh, your comments on this but also related uh, point from my side is uh, to what extent you you know representing private sector is there an appetite in the current circumstances to you know acquire uh, the distribution companies uh, is private sector you know cesc tata azadani is and so on you know will you all invest be you know if the government is to run a process agar uh, just to interrupt i love this sir first time message that he wants to talk for 2 minutes so or 3 minutes anyway we are running 45 minutes late so please give him 3 4 minutes to talk huh? i love this sir sure but i don't know whether we can uh, you know unmute him uh, you know i i don't know whether technology allows that i think nidhi nidhi that is possible can you unmute and let uh, mr ailavadi speak for few minutes uh, nidhi we can't hear you Can you hear you me can. now? Can you hear yes, me now? Yes, yes. So I'm saying uh, I can't find him in the attendees. If I I do, oh, no, then, then I can. Yes, left. Okay. Otherwise, I could have tried to unmute him. But Mr. Niyogi, sir, you can come yeah. in. Yeah, Gaurav. Yes. Uh, uh, let me try to try, try and uh, 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 respond to Ms. Uh, Mr. Ayla Wode. he he has seen it all because you know uh, he was also the regulator when haryana almost two decades back was con- contemplating privatization of uh, dhb ven the bvn and uhb vn under, under, under uh, world bank tutelage and it didn't happen so if, if it didn't happen it is also because uh, the point i mentioned right in the beginning that uh, unless there is political consensus and legislative support it is extremely difficult to to pull off privatization because you know it's an ideological con- conflict and uh, it is also the case that uh, there is a trust deficit in terms of considering private capital as being stigmatized but rather than staying abstract you know why you know in spite of changes uh, regulatory frameworks uh, being realigned why eventually the transformation has not taken place it's because the change agenda isn't there and, and the point has been very well brought out by uh, mr shalas shivastava that you know we need to invest in people but 
essentially see what we lack is the alignment the the you know the align first of all building linkages of people process and performance and and, and building scorecards to at least show where we are and where we can be that's one but more importantly the alignment of what the organization sets itself uh, as as the overarching goals the objectives which we can uh, you know say, uh, say as the kpis the key performance indicators that is those are not drilled down to the operational level and then you know we do not have the congruence of individual performances aligning with the organizational target so unless we have that you know there is no kind, there is no such vision that people down the line or those in the front line front line can have so what's the organizational way of moving forward we are talking of you know making the organization future ready future shock proof moving towards a net zero future uh, but you know would that percolate down the organization so you know unless we see these goals at the granular level in terms of managing the network in terms of uh, undertaking the metering billing collection services in terms of uh, you know improving the loss control and then scale it up scale it up the organization and move it up to the organizational targets unless this awareness is there unless the alignment is there the core efficiencies of the distribution companies are not going to improve see what we are seeing in terms of balance sheet what sanjeev said in the right in the beginning uh, and and we are seeing this what uh, almost three bailout packages and 15 years later you know the our losses are somewhere around 5 lakh crores and our accumulated debt is also around 5 lakh crores and in fact the net worth is about minus uh, 1.8 1.8 lakh crores so that is where we are so essentially since you no matter what changes we have been contemplating what regulation we have been bringing in in fact it's not that you know we are not setting cost reflective tariff that is the ultimate motto but then again you know what is there in the form of uh, uh, regulation is far removed from the reality because as Pil as Pil uh, uh, regi said you know we we are far from the, the for, for far from the, being data secure and making you know our our information not asymmetric so you know the, this is where you know we are falling short so unless we have data security data integrity full proof uh, you know uh, data which can support uh, you know somebody somebody the, uh, you know down the line had also mentioned that you know we are talking of 17% i think reggie himself you know we do not really know you know whether 17% is correct or 35% is correct so so the, the major issue where we are getting stuck is that the basic core issue of improving our efficiencies and having at least fundamental aspect of metering, 100% metering, which was part of Electricity Act legislation. If that is not ensured, you know, no matter of uh, sophistication, smart metering, up the line is not going to give us results. So essentially, what I'm saying, trying to put forth is the transformative agenda of turning around the organization is abjectly missing. And we do not have the alignment of frontliners with the top management functioning in order to achieve the organizational goals. Number two, to get back to Gaurav, yes, you know, there is fair amount of uh, interest of private sector participating in the distribution reform process. But as Mr. Srivastava also said that if there are 27 states, then there may be, you know, uh, uh, you know 300 cases uh, of uh, dealing with them separately, just because the dynamics are different from case to case. So in some places, as you rightly pointed out, that the ATNC loss may be high, and in some cases it may be low, but the, the efficiencies paradoxically are, are very much uh, uh, on the negative side. Now, for, for the private sector to participate, obviously, you know, the, the big documents uh, will have to be uh, not conforming to one size fits all. But the basic tenets would be A, uh, you know, there has to be a regulatory buy-in of binding performance obligations. So in order to, you know, uh, give them a fillip, 
to the selection process. In fact, Mr. Srivastava talked of T1, almost on the same lines. The selection process should give due credence to the business plan which one is presenting. Again, you know, what, what he's saying about that this is the state as is, and I can take this to 2B to, to situation. And uh, what is the kind of process flow I am anticipating, and this is how I am trying to uh, bring the uh, improvements forward and align my investments accordingly. Three, you see, basically, you know, you have to restructure the utility operations. So you have to start with a clean balance sheet with only serviceable liabilities. And this is where we, go, we went wrong uh, if, uh, in a few instances. And I'm talking of uh, ownership transfer, not merely franchising. For in most cases, you know, you have to bring in the concept of transitional financing so that at least during the initial period, if there are cash losses, that those can be addressed. And how you do that? You see, again, you, know, you make it transparent. If it is a transitional financing, let there be bidding on it in the sense that, you know, whoever seeks the lowest finance is the preferred bidder and you combine the bidding with efficiency sharing. So it's initial period of transitional financing combined with efficiency gain sharing in the subsequent period, which can be also asymmetric. You know, it can be sort of, I, I share 20% of the gain uh, at the end of the transition period with consumer and I scale it up to as much as 50 or 50%, 50 let's say over a period of time. So you can do a hybrid combination. So of a transition financing with efficiency gain sharing in order to structure the bid. And last but not the least, I think this is also a point that had come around in the discussion, that a private sector participation should always have the flexibility of procuring its own power and not necessarily saddle with uh, legacy PPAs, uh, which do not always lead to efficient costs. Thank you. Thank you, Neobis. Mr. Padmanabhan, I saw you raising your finger once or yeah, twice. Just, just a quick point on data. Yeah, please Mr. make I think it. You had this question and I thought Mr. Regi answered it very well. But, you know, when you began your presentation, uh, Sanjeev, in the beginning, you mentioned about what we had done in the generation side and done rather well. Also, when we look at generation, you will recall that in the 70s and uh, mid 80s until the early 90s, our plant load factors are very, very low, 45%, 40%, and so on and so forth in many of our thermal power plants. Today, it's increased to 75, maybe even greater. Some of it is due to technology, but a lot of it is due to, a lot of it is also due to data, which has been shared across utilities in terms of o &M. So I think there is success in terms of what we have done on the generation side to improve the plant load factor, the capacity factors of our power plants through good adroit data management and sharing of the data and best practices and so on. I wonder why we can't do it on the distribution side, you know, and get the same level of successes which we had on the generation side, apart from technology, which definitely did play a role, but there were also a lot on good data management in terms of heat rate improvements and getting those know-hows transferred to other utilities in terms of how to handle high ash Indian coals and so on. There's a wealth of information which CEA had actually promoted and actually uh, disseminated. So I think there's some lessons to be learned within the power sector. That's the limited point I wanted to make. Yeah, uh, just to tell you that, you know, in fact, one of the participants, uh, I can find his name. He had actually suggested that we should have a national regulatory agency for the distribution sector also, because mm -hmm. it is that it is national level regulation, which allowed generation to grow and to become productive. And uh, that experience is not replicated in all the states. So there's a problem, but we, I think, have to change the constitution of India for that. that <laughs> so that'll, that'll take another complete seminar on its own. Uh, Gaurav tell me that uh, sadly the time is up. So first and foremost, we would like to apologize, you know, to all the many participants who joined us and uh, uh, who sent very kindly sent in their questions. 
Sadly, we have not been able to take up all the questions, but let me please assure you that uh, both the institutions, uh, India Smart Grid Forum and RTI, will ensure that these questions that you sent will be circulated to all the panelists. And personally, I would I have them already because uh, uh, Renu, I think, very kindly, or Nidhi, kindly sent them to me. But it would be really uh, learning for all the panelists to have the questions because, you know, this is the voice of the people who are hearing you. And some of the issues we have not dealt with because of shortage of time. But in conclusion, I mean, I, let me just say that this has been personally for me, and I'm sure for all of us, a hugely rewarding uh, exchange of views and a very uh, informed high level exchange of views because the six panelists that we had uh, were of such outstanding quality. And I think the, the, the broad uh, conclusion we come to that there is a sense of optimism uh, that uh, we are on the cusp of change and that uh, you know there is a silver lining at the end of whichever road we are going down. But particularly in the context of distribution, uh, as Mr. Miyogi and uh, as uh, Shalab also pointed out, that you know I think the change has to start um, from the ground upwards and you have to start with the customer, recognize the customer, which would include all the points that Reggie has made about how do we get to know the customer if we don't know who it actually is, you know, because the way the billing is done. So recognize your customer, understand your customer, be in touch with your customer, understand the needs of your customer, and then cater to those needs. Uh, CK Prahlad, who was a, you know, uh, who the late CK Prahlad, uh, who was a business uh, thinker in the US, he actually said that, you know, there's an entire fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. And companies like Unilever have made millions out of, you know, marketing small sachets to those who couldn't afford an entire big bottle of shampoo. So I think, you know, these marketing interventions and marketing innovations, financial innovations, digital innovations, these are the things that should form the bulk of uh, the revenue of distribution. Uh, no distribution company has reached that far. And uh, I think that is where we need to go to look for profits and not simply try and always get it through what are euphemistically called user charges. Because please remember that by parting his or her data to you as the distribution company, I am already paying. In a way, that's like a quasi-user charge that I'm allowing you to use my data. And though I know there's been a big debate on privacy and judgment is there, but for most Indians, you know, um, we, we like our privacy, but there are ways to aggregate data so that you don't encroach on anybody's privacy, but still keep it business friendly and usable. So I think that entire segment, which relates to what uh, Reggie was telling us in detail about, the entire aspect of energy efficiency, which has not yet been you know, completely utilized, that potential has not been used by us. The aspect of you know, full resource, all of, all of all system planning as it were, you know, integrated resource uh, uh, and IRP, IRP or integrated resource. You know, I don't like the word planning. So I met, Rookies are down as soon as I have to say planning. So integrated resource management, you know, uh, uh, which some of which which Shalif talk about, which of course uh, Mr. Padmanam is in strong on, uh, and also uh, what you know basically uh, Anjali said. Anjali introduced high notes of optimism, and we are thankful to her for that. And so uh, there are a lot of uh, commonalities, um, you know, in terms of what the participants. Focused on, uh, we'll stay engaged. Maybe uh, Gaurav will come back to you with another one of these delightful sessions and we'll carry the conversation forward. We hand it over to uh, uh, Renu uh, who, to conclude the session. Uh, who else but you can have the last one? Me now to deliver the word of thanks. Okay.
Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks uh, to such an esteemed uh, uh, panelist and uh, our esteemed moderators. So I'll start with uh, again, once again, uh, a big thank you to our uh, panelists and moderators for an insightful and thought-provoking discussion. It was indeed very interesting uh, panel, and I've already seen uh, many participants uh, uh, sharing uh, their uh, views about the webinar, being very informative and insightful. Our uh, enlightened uh, speakers have covered all the issues pertaining uh, uh, to the uh, past, present and future uh, of the electricity distribution system in India to the extent possible. And in the, in the limited time, uh, though we exceeded originally the scheduled time, uh, but um, uh, and I would also like to thank all our participants for their active participation. Uh, there were uh, more than 100 questions we received from the audience and uh, uh, we had uh, over uh, 1000 registrations uh, from 370 locations for this webinar. So thank you so much for your enthusiastic uh, response to this webinar. And um, owing to the positive of time, all the questions could not be uh, taken up, but uh, we will try and send the replies uh, on mail to you uh, in the next uh, few days. And we will also be mailing the recording of this webinar uh, to all our uh, participants as uh, we have seen a lot of participants requesting for it. So with those words, I really would like to thank you all once again for being part of this webinar and uh, hope uh, to have your participation, uh, continued participation in our uh, future events. Please stay safe and uh, take good care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.